2021 um, Nuclear Decommissioning Citizens Advisory Panel Committee to our board. So uh, we'll go through um, attendance. Thanks, Brian. Uh, my name is John Tony, selected to be here from the town of Plymouth, Massachusetts. Uh, Mr. Grassi. I think he's still on mute, John. <laughs> Rich Grassi, I was appointed by the minority member of the House. Uh, Ms. Dubois. Pine Dubois, appointed by the uh, President of the House of Representatives. Joe O'Brien. Uh, Pat O'Brien, uh, Senior Manager of Government Affairs and Communications, and I'm a designee of the licensee of Holtec. Ms. Lampert. Um, Mary Lansford appointed by the Senate President. Mr. Rothstein. Rich Rothstein, Town of Plymouth Board of Selectmen appointee. Jack. Jack Priest, Director of Radiation Control Program for the Massachusetts Bureau of Environmental Health, Department of Public Health. I think I see a Mr. Riveros. Yes, he's representing Sam. Mr. Viveros, are you substituting for someone tonight? Sorry hey, about that, didn't hear. Uh, John Viveros, Technical Hazard Supervisor for MEMA, uh, filling in for Sam Phillips, Director of MEMA. Thank you, John. Sure. Moylan? Yep, John Moylan, Site Vice President, Film Station. Mr. Flores? Yes, John Flores, uh, representing Governor uh, Jolly Baker. Dave Nichols. David Nichols, appointed by Governor Baker. Mr. Drabinski is a guest. Uh, Mr. Daly. Uh, Mr. Gerard Martin. Uh, Robert Jones. Good evening, Robert Jones, Executive Office, Health and Human Services, uh, designated by Secretary Mary Lou Sutters. Mr. Johnson. Hi, Dave Johnston, Massachusetts Department of Our Protection, Southeast Regional Office, designee of Environmental Affairs Secretary Theoretes. Mary Waldron. Good evening, everyone. Mary Waldron, Executive Director of the Old Colony Planning Council. Mr. Hayden. Hi, good evening, Bob Hayden, Massachusetts Department of Public Utilities. Good job, Bob. And I was quick. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Pickering. Seth Pickering, Mass DEP, Southeast Region, um, Deputy Regional Director for the Bureau of Air and Waste. All right, thank you. Previous minutes, Pine? Uh, yeah. Um, so previous minutes uh, drafted by uh, Secretary of Environmental Affairs reps, I think Tori Kim. Um, I have, did everybody get them from us, I hope, and able to review. I had a couple of corrections in there. Dave Noyes is listed as a panelist, whereas he is um, an ongoing technical assistance from CDI Pilgrim. Uh, so we want to just take him off of that part. And then um, I did have a couple of comments. Do you have your volume on? Um, I had a couple of comments from people that we should be listing those absent. So I have from my notes absent from the last meeting of March 29th, Sean Mullen, Kevin O'Reilly, Rich Grassi, Amy Naples, Dick Quintal, and Susan Whitaker. Does any... Um, I also wanted to add to guests in attendance, Matt Daly. I believe, Matt, you are here. Um, yes. As far as anything else is concerned, I didn't have any other corrections except to, to, uh, to uh, the references, the spelling for Mr. Daly in the notes. It came out as Danley a couple of times. Um, and I know Rich Rothstein had a comment as to uh, the last page six, line 37. He would like the 
entirety of his comment included in the minutes. Rich, do you want to speak to that? Uh, sure. <clears throat> Toward the end of the meeting, following public comment before the meeting adjourned, um, and after looking at the draft meeting minutes, I felt the uh, state did an excellent job overall identifying and writing in great detail the various topics and ensuing discussions that took place at the March meeting. Um, however, I think uh, that line 37, uh, the, the uh, editor or writer kind of wrote, I felt in a somewhat perfunctory manner, Mr. Rothstein shared thoughts about the state of the panel and its scope of oversight. And um, Pine, uh, uh, do you want me to read uh, what I, I feel should go in there, which reflects exactly what I stated at the meeting? Well, you, you, you sent it to me. Oh, okay. It's up to, you know, it's up to whether the panel wants to hear it or not. It's a, it's a rather... Okay. In a nutshell, I was giving my opinion about the discussion um, regarding the um, um, scope of the end cap in terms of should it be addressing just the uh, um, physical aspects of decommissioning the plant or also be getting into issues about uh, dry cast storage, uh, um, uh, and off-site uh, if season, so forth and so on. So um, I made a statement uh, to that well, effect. Rich, I had a thought about that. Can I put, can we like add it as a footnote? Uh, that would be fine. Uh, is, so why don't, why don't I do that? That way I can just, you know, it, it's fairly <clears throat> direct and she has other footnotes in here. Uh, so. That would be fine. I think as long as the thought gets in there because uh, it kind of captured, I felt it kind of captured the essence of uh, some of the um, trying to cool the temperature in the room a bit. Okay. I think if we're going to include it in the minutes, we should read what it is since the panel members haven't seen that statement. Um, okay. Um, it's we're here for it. Pine's permission. Not mine. John's running the meeting. Pine's permission. I need to put my volume up now. No, no, they can hear you. Okay. What I had read, written and read at the close, toward the close of the March Endicat meeting was um, during the past two Endicat meetings, I sensed a potential schism developing between the IWG and panel members, including the attending public, as to whether the panel's current and future responsibilities should be strictly limited to addressing environmental site assessment, physical plant demolishment, debris removal, and site cleanup and restoration, uh, e.g. Jack Preet's interpretation of decommissioning, or to include other aspects of nuclear power plant decommissioning that is even addressed in the PSDAR, uh, namely on-site spent nuclear fuel storage in the pool and dry cask, where Holtex decommissioning trust fund needed to be adequate to ensure financial management of the IFC until such time that DOE takes title and removes the spent fuel to an off-site interim IFC or permanent federal repository. My opinion is that the panel's mission and focus per the 2016 states enacted legislation and the PSDAR is to still include addressing on-site spent nuclear fuel storage in terms of safety, security, environmental, and financial decommissioning trust fund in parentheses considerations, notwithstanding all spent nuclear fuel will be contained within the on-site IFC by 2022, according to Holtec. But ultimate, what ultimately may or may not happen legislatively in the coming years at the federal level regarding any interim off-site IFCs to be built by the private sector or a permanent federal repository of spent nuclear fuel while well, likewise an important topic for the panel to be periodically considering in the scheme of things, the panel should not get overly distracted and bogged down on things that are beyond our immediate control and authority, parentheses, i.e. our elected state and federal legislative representatives have the responsibility to, quote, do their jobs. That's what I had uh, stated on March 29th. Uh, I would add <clears throat> that was a very important clarification because I think 
the public and also if you look at the legislation forming the NDCAP, it is clear that fan fuel storage is probably one of the top issues to consider that is part of decommissioning until the ISTE license is terminated. And it's probably going to outlive our children. And so to ignore this and say it's not the responsibility of this group is irresponsible. So thank you, Rich. And it should not be in a footnote. I would prefer it to be given more importance. Anything else, John? You okay with that? So I proposed a motion to include Rich's statement as a comment in the meeting minutes from our March meeting. Second. All right, we have a motion by Mr. Priest and a second by Mr. O'Brien. Any discussion on said motion? I think Rich Grassy has his hand raised, unless it was by accident. I, 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 he, I guess he doesn't. Oh, and it's showing up on my screen. I, I do have my hand raised, but after you guys have that discussion, I have a question. Oh, Sue Whitaker is here. Yeah, okay, we see, yes. Yeah, she just showed up. So there's a motion uh, for the members to approve. Okay, so does anybody have any con any uh, discussion on the motion by Mr. Priest? Okay, Mr. Grassi, you had a question. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Uh, Chair. Um, I'm a little confused. Is Does the Town of Plymouth Board of Selectmen have a representative on the NDCAP? And who is that? <laughs> I've never seen anybody represented from the Board of Selectmen other than yourself, John. Is there some sort of an issue? Interesting. Well, no, I, 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 are you referring to an actual sitting current select board member, correct? Correct. Like you, you had the, you occupied the chair at the previous meetings for the last three or four years as a representative of the town of Plymouth Board of Selectmen. Do we have a chair that's representative of that title? And if we do, who is it? Yeah, that, uh, that's um, Mr. Richard Quintil. Uh, he is currently the chair of the Plymouth Select Board. Um, you know, I communicate with him frequently. Obviously, he's, you know, there was a loss of a member there, I believe, uh, six days ago. Right. He is getting reacclimated to that position. <clears throat> he's got a lot on his plate, and I think he understands that it's, you know it's a pretty talented group here and just because of the timing and we've gone to every 60 days now rich but um you know i'll i'll oppress i'll oppress upon mr quinto the next time i can talk to him that hopefully we can get him uh, in in on the july meeting maybe when i get through with my presentation tonight you'll see the importance of what i'm talking about okay okay rich, thank you but anything else on with respect to jack's motion Move your question. All right. I'm going to take a vote on Jack's uh, motion. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Just hold up your hand to the screen. You seeing everything here? You can just say any opposed. Okay. Okay. Now, any opposed? Just hold up your hand. Much easier. Thank you very much. <laughs> Any abstentions? Looks unanimous. All right, so it looks like it's unanimous. Yeah. All right. Thanks. And I did have a. I did have just a couple of other uh, typos. I will call them. Um, so with that, I'll, um, we'll accept the minutes. We're going. So we need a motion to accept the minutes. So moved. Who was that? Second. <laughs> So Pat and the second. Patrick O'Brien made the motion. Dave Nichols uh, seconded. Right. Any any discussion on the minutes? I will take a vote on the minutes. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any in opposition to the minutes? Great. All right, looks like it's uh, unanimous. Thank you. All right, moving right along. Now uh, we're going to go to the whole tech CDI Pilgrim decommissioning upgrade from uh, Mr. Patrick O'Brien. Uh, 
Sure. Thanks. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Let me uh, just share my screen real quick. I'm going to have to do a little bit of juggling because I have a couple things as part of this presentation today. So let me start here. All right. I think everyone can see that. Um, so, you know, thanks for, for having me uh, on the panel and allowing me to speak as always. Um, a lot has uh, occurred since the last time we met a couple months ago. We did, um, as required, provide the NRC with our annual uh, trust fund update and spent fuel management um, submittal on uh, March 31st. That was shared with the, the chair who then shared it with the committee. This is the updated uh, waterfall chart that we use and shared with the NRC externally. Uh, still shows your, your site characterization and investigation work uh, towards the license termination plan. So as you can see, ongoing site characterization uh, through the project. Uh, there'll be uh, uh, more information tonight from our uh, license site professional ERM, uh, Matt and, and John speaking later uh, directly on where we are in that process. When it comes to spent fuel management, um, you, you see we still have, uh, we do still have fuel in the pool. Uh, we had done the earlier campaign last year, the first uh, campaign since we had started decommissioning. Uh, we do have the upcoming uh, final fuel campaign uh, to occur uh, beginning in June and uh, scheduled to finish uh, in November. And then it will be uh, especially only dry fuel storage uh, for the, the fuel at that point. Continue to work on in, in reactor segmentation. I'll speak to that a little bit later. Uh, and then we'll do some, some vessel and, and hardware segmentation. Obviously along this path, you've seen my previous updates, some of the outbuilding demolition and, and deconstruction that we've been doing, that, that goes right through the project. Uh, similar to waste management, I'll give a little update on that tonight. And then eventually the, the final site restoration piece uh, here towards the back end of 2026, 2027 uh, with the, the project uh, moving on in that direction. So I asked for kind of a, a high level overview from my, uh, my uh, regulatory and financial folks to try to help explain um, the submittal. Um, so this shows the actual costs and reimbursements from August 27, 2019 when Holtec took over the plant through December 31st, 2020. Uh, it does have that updated uh, decommissioning trust balance of $881 million. And the estimates of the remaining costs uh, are for, from January 1, uh, 20, that should be 2021, sorry through final license cost for termination. Uh, revised milestone schedule reflecting the work completed in the schedule ahead. Um, some of the, the, the impacts and changes that you'll see numbers wise is that we've, we've in, improved that fuel on pad date. I think originally uh, you heard me speak uh, previous meetings that we had looked to have all fuel on pad by January of next year. Um, that's, uh, that's been pushed up uh, utilizing some of the, the fleet model uh, and learnings from Oyster Creek that I'll speak to a little bit later. Uh, they actually just completed their, their fuel campaign um, last Friday. Uh, obviously, we've done optimization of some of the work activities to ensure that we're efficient and effective uh, in protecting the money in the trust fund. So we've done some site security modifications on hand. If you physically came to the site, you'd, you'd see them. I think, Pine, you've probably seen some of them in, on some of your visits, uh, some of the updated security revisions that we've done uh, to enhance the... Uh, the, the uh, footprint and effectiveness of what we need for safety uh, on the site. Uh, we've accomplished uh, early demo of some of those non-rad structures that I've spoken to before. Uh, we've pulled up some of that uh, demolition planning and preparation uh, and, uh, and been cleaning out a number of buildings. I'll speak a little bit later to, to where we are with a couple of those. And we, one of the key things that ha occurred this past year is we did um, get a new waste disposal contract at WCS. Um, so that's helped us uh, improve our timeline, our schedule uh, for both uh, the work being accomplished and also for the waste disposal uh, in an efficient manner um, to ensure that we're, uh, we're uh, being uh, careful with the trust fund monies. So you will, you will see looking at the numbers, there was increased costs in 2020, but those will be offset because we did pull a lot of work forward. And just at a high level, um, you know, this was the initial 2020 submission. This is the initial 2021 submission. The plan at that point was to spend about 101 million. The estimate to still complete was 1.031 billion uh, for the 1.132 uh, total cost. We did spend 277. Um, there's 824 left uh, to complete. And that total cost is down uh, to that 1.1. Um, I, I, if we want a little more in depth, I can I hope to have um, you know someone from regulatory come on and, and explain it a little bit in depth. But I wanted to kind of give that high level overview of the submittal. And actually, back here, and the panel will get this. 
that's the actual link to the full submittal uh, for uh, 2021. Demolition continues. Uh, we demolished a fire water storage tank uh, about a week ago, week and a half ago. Uh, that's pictures of that. We had two fire water storage tanks. That one is still full. So this one has been uh, taken down and there still is preparations and planning for uh, removal of the demineralized water tank, uh, hopefully to occur within the next month. Uh, condensate storage tanks are scheduled for uh, the third quarter of 2021. We've continued to prepare for the upcoming fuel campaign. There was a couple of small uh, column trailer type buildings along the, uh, the hall path that had previously housed equipment for a since demolished Met Tower. Um, so we, we've cleaned those up and, and uh, prepared that area for uh, the fuel transfer to ensure that there's good sight lines uh, that's necessary for security when we move the fuel. Uh, we have plans to demo another small outbuilding. It's a K4 building uh, in June. We're just awaiting the permitting there. It's another one of those sheet metal type buildings that we've previously demo demolished. Uh, the old administrative building that's attached, uh, you know, everyone's I think seen it in, in pictures to the uh, the turbine building. Um, we're, we're doing gapping uh, right now. There'll be asbestos abatement, uh, working uh, obviously very closely with the state on that. And the plan would be uh, if we go all according to the schedule, demolish that piece in July. And then the big one for, for sight lines on, on the property, uh, our plan is to demolish the main warehouse and the uh, O&M building. So we've been re relocating staff um, to the ESB, which is the engineering support building uh, where I have my office. Uh, we're relocating the radiological controlled area checkpoint inside uh, the turbine building uh, entrance there. Uh, warehouse internals, uh, we're, we're doing some removal there uh, right now. And then there will be security modifications. Uh, when you take down obviously a building of that size, uh, and stature, uh, there'll be uh, some necessary improvements and changes that we'll need to do to ensure that we stay compliant with our protected areas. So that's all in the uh, process right now. Uh, Brian McWilliams, our security managers, and his team have done a nice job uh, working with the site to ensure that you know we stay compliant and everything goes according to plan there. Internal uh, segmentation uh, has continued uh, up until recently. Uh, we do have the greater than class C waste, the top guide and the mid core shroud. Those are staged for loading uh, in non-fuel uh, waste containers, which will occur after the fuel campaign uh, wraps up towards the end of the year. Uh, we will still do a little bit of segmentation while the fuel works ongoing. We'll do some jet pump segmentation in August. Um, and we're continuing waste reduction work in the dryer separator pit before we actually uh, begin the fuel work. This picture right here is the top, top guide. That's some of the greater than class C waste uh, being removed from the vessel. Uh, this picture in the middle shows uh, part of that being segmented and loaded into these racks. Uh, so that'll be stored there uh, for the duration of the fuel campaign until we um, do the non-fuel waste containers with those later. And then that is that mid-core shroud uh, that I referenced here uh, that's being loaded onto the cutting table uh, for segmentation. Where's the jet pump, Pat? The jet pump, so over here, it's uh, right here, this blue box. The jet pump assemblies are in this part of the reactor. So if you're kind of looking from the top down coming, these areas in green are what we've already uh, worked through and completed. So the steam dryer, steam separator, you've heard me speak to and show pictures of before. Uh, the spargers, the top guide, which is this piece right here. Um, you know, the core spray um, pieces, those, those are down. So this is the next set to, to, to go as we work through the vessel. And then previously I had mentioned we had done the control rod drive mechanisms. Those, those come on from underneath in the reactor. So those were previously removed. I wanna say middle of last year, if my memory serves me. So we're still working through that process. Uh, continue with, with waste management. Um, you know, to date we've shipped 10 class A um, uh, segments, class A boxes. Uh, we've done four dry active waste container, which are C vans, uh, eight foot by 20 foot um, containers. And the, uh, I know you'd seen pictures of them previously that I had showed the concrete shield blocks uh, that used to be on top of the, uh, the uh, reactor when it was running uh, to provide shielding. Uh, those have been uh, cut up and, and a number of those are in transit. They've gone truck to rail. Uh, we have uh, five uh, B, B boxes, uh, containers that I've showed previously that, that uh, waste staging area that we have. Um, those are, are uh, We've, we've done five of those boxes into that waste stage, staging area uh, that'll be ready for shipment. And then just a picture to the right, just some, some of the more recent uh, things. Internally to the condenser bay, there's a lot of uh, 
materials, uh, scaffolding, things along those uh, lines, tooling that had been used over the years uh, that were, uh, were doing some clean out in the condenser bay. And that's what we're seeing here is packages of that waste uh, being shipped from truck to rail. Uh, again. So, so where's the rail depot? What uh, rail? Mansfield. Thanks. Truck Mansfield. Yep. Um, Patrick, could you just mention uh, the trucks that are loaded, uh, what routes they get to the rail? Or they the rail takes over, or the main yeah. route. Um, I'd have to double check. I know the I know the trucking routes out of the state truck. You know, truck to final destination. I'm not sure offhand. I if it follows a similar path, it should go powerhouse the three A to forty the old of the new forty four to four ninety five is usually the way that would go. But I can double check with uh with Jim Buckley, our waste manager. It, all those, every time we do a shipment, uh, I think it's important to note that, um, you know, all of that is 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 uh, shared with the state and the lo locals. So emergency management, police, uh, I know police and fire, and uh, I know there's a, a DPH, no, DEP, sorry, DEP and DPH contacts, I believe. That's, Jack and DJ might correct me. I just, I know there's, there's a whole uh, list that our shippers have to, uh, uh, provide notice to before before and after their shift, actually, and those do include the routes. Uh, we've conducted some recent training. I know there was this, there was talk at, at, at previous meetings. Uh, we do continue to uh, to work with any uh, you know interested local uh, uh, departments that you know want to come down and and you know have the potential to be um, mutual aid responders. So we did have Duxbury and Kingston Fire. Uh, over the course of two days last week, come down and do uh, a little bit of just education and training uh, and um, provided them with a site tour. Uh, we're still working to schedule the Plymouth County Technical Rescue Team. I know that's been a big concern. I, I believe a Chief Nord in Duxbury, he wants to get that team down there. Um, you know, more of a, could something happen uh, during decommissioning when you're demolishing a structure? Uh, you know, kind of having that team have the understanding of what uh, the site looks like. So working with him to schedule that still, but, uh, you know, kind of working through, uh, you know, the requests that have been made. And, and we've done a lot of work with uh, with the, uh, the the team that John Viveris leads over at MEMA, the, the regional uh, team that we still have the quarterly meeting. So that's what, where this original training had come out of. And then uh, we're gearing up right now uh, for the final fuel campaign. Uh, we are starting to in-process some of the, those team members. Uh, we've continued to receive uh, delivery of the High Storm uh, 100 systems and the MPCs. Those are the pictures to the right. Uh, we've been staging those up on the new pad uh, prior to it being operational. So they're bringing those there. We'll fill those with concrete uh, and bring, begin to bring those down to site uh, as needed when we begin the, uh, the fuel campaign. Uh, so that as I had mentioned earlier, is scheduled to begin in June and will be completed by November. Um, Oyster Creek just completed their total fuel offload on Friday. That was a, a world record uh, from the time to shut down to uh, load those, uh, those uh, canisters. So Pat, I got a question on concrete. Should I ask it now or later? You can ask it. So um, <clears throat> are you using, are, are local firms involved or is that completely on site? And is there a special, um, Sort of formula for the concrete. So the, the, yes, the so yes, local involved, um, and yes, it is a special. It's it, it's a certain density. Uh, I know. I'm trying to think back, and John John Moylan might be able to jump in and correct me if I'm wrong. But I know um, there's tests that occur when the batches come from the plants to ensure they meet the required specification. Yeah. Um, so, and I know, I do remember in the last one, there were a couple uh, that had come originally, they did not meet the qualifications, we sent them away, and, uh, you know, more trucks came. So it's a, it's a pretty lengthy process. John, I don't know if you want to add anything to that, but. No, that's a, that's a good description, Patrick. We okay. do test, we do have specifications for it, and um, we have to test each batch uh, to ensure that they, they meet those specifications. And, and so the density that you're talking about is for impact resistance or something like that? Or what is the sort of guiding? I believe it's a number of factors. Um, shielding, I think, is the key one. Um, mm -hmm. Ensuring that we have the proper shielding with the, uh, with the density of the concrete. Okay. That's it. No, real basic question. Thanks. Yeah. Well, that's good because I, I got basic answers. I see you, Mary. Go ahead. Oh, uh, yeah. 
I, I noted that you didn't mention delivery of any overpack or something that if something goes wrong, if something goes wrong with a canister, there's a crack. I, I don't know what I mean. These are the not a mention of having uh, what I called, I guess you call it overpack or what have you. That's what the high storms are. The high storms are the overpacks and then the MPCs are the piece that goes inside. So that's what's being Yeah, I, I, I understand okay. that. But if something goes wrong, <clears throat> Dr. Singh had or had talked about that he it would have something to encapsulate the cast. And so if there's obviously there's nothing there to, you know, like I have a bandage in, in my medicine cabinet, but there is nothing there that you mentioned that would be on site. And so the next two questions would be. Has there been a time analysis on how long something it would take to get something from New Jersey up here while a cat potentially is leaking? And number two, has there been a application to NRC to approve that talk about fix? And how long would that take? Uh, I think I've said previously that obviously, you know, as Holtec is the owner and the designer of the cast, but also the owner of the fuel, you know, we're responsible to stay compliant. There's not a requirement to have something like that on site. Um, there is the opportunity that you would put it in a, a high state transportation overpack, high star over, uh, overpack. Um, but the key really is that the aging management pro program would show long before a leak occurring. Um, uh, so not, not necessarily. I think I'm talking about defense in depth, but you, I guess, answered the, you didn't answer the question, but hopefully you will. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to answer the best I can. Obviously, I'm talking about the fuel campaign that's coming up, and I'm, I'm basically just mm -hmm. updating on where we are through this process, you know. Hey, Pat, this is Jack. Yes, Jack. So if uh, during this fuel campaign, if they had an issue with uh, an assembly or an issue with a canister, they could simply put it back in the pool for now until that was resolved on its ultimate destination point. Is that correct? Correct, yep. Yep, we have the same approach as the industry, but that would be what we would do is to, to bring it back in the building. Uh, most likely you would identify anything before uh, it would even leave the building. So with the testing you know, related to, and I'll show the, uh, where, what I was gonna show next is the video from the last uh, campaign in the process uh, of actually loading fuel and, and bringing it out to the pad. How soon after um, the assemblies are out of the pool will destruction of the pool begin? I don't. And, and all their support. Yeah, I'm screenshotting the attendees. Yeah, how, long, how long will the pool be available? I don't know offhand. John, do you know? I don't know where it is in our, in our schedule where the building is. I thought the building was later. Um, in our schedule, 25, 20, 24, 25, somewhere in that range? Um, the building is later, that is correct. Um, there will be plans to drain the pool and to uh, continue segmentation. So just later is the answer? The per like I said, the, 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 the building itself that houses the pool isn't scheduled for demolition until 2425. So well, I bet it's the pool and its support systems that are required to keep the pool going. So it would be functional to use, as Jack suggested, uh, to put a problem back into the pool. Yeah, and what Jack suggested is during loading and during this process right now, if there was an issue, it would go back in, which is correct. Um, same as what, what, what others in the industry would do. Um, you know, you'd identify that well before it gets outside um, right now, you know. Through yeah, but I'm, I was talking about once it's outside. Yeah, I, I understand that. We've had fuel right now that's been outside for over five years. Mm -hmm. I, you yeah, know, I, right. You know, so I'm just kind of going down that path of. Okay, so maybe you could get a more definitive answer. Of yeah, I mean, it's, it's similar. Of the exact timing that we could expect in a waterfall city. <laughs> that the pool would be available for use as a fix. Yeah, we can we, we can look into that, but like okay, I said- that's great, I'm not gonna belabor it. That's yeah, great. no, as segmentation goes, you know, like to John's point, as segmentation goes, there will be 
uh, parts that will be removed along the way. Uh, and again, there's no requirement to have that pool. I mean, you have the same problem out at Row. If something were to happen to Row, and they've had casts out there for 15 years. I didn't, I didn't say there was. No, I'm just saying it, they're casts out there with no with no building, no 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 pool. So I mean, you're in the same situation in other parts of the state. No, oh, well, so. I was just wondering. If I think me. we have another question from Bobby Hayden. Yeah, so we'll good uh, I'm sorry, I, I didn't mean to raise my hand. I apologize for that. Did I? Did Jack, I? Jack, you go. <laughs> yep. Yeah, so, um, Pine, for the purpose of capturing action items that we discussed at the last meeting, so that's a request from um, Mary for Holtec to provide more detailed waterfall showing spent fuel pool demolition. So we want to capture that in our minutes. Yeah. Yeah. I, just to be, I just want to be and I would add to it, it's not only spent fuel demolition, that the capability to use the pool because the support systems required for it to would be there. Yeah, understand. I will say the Jack, I will say the waterfall is the waterfall. That's that's what we share publicly. Um, you know, when we go down that path, we, we've had that conversation when we went through the AG's agreement. It's, there's, I, there's a public water. I, I, under, I understand that path. I'll get, I'll get some gotta, timing. But but Mary is correct when she says there is there is systems that, that go along with the pool that will be removed from service and, uh, you know, dealt with ahead of the 24-25 when the building would go. But I'll, I'll, I'll try to get a more definitive answer as to when that is. Yeah. Because when you said you went through that, I've read the confidentiality and settlement agreement, and uh, what you just said doesn't fit. What yeah, I mean, what I what I've recalled hearing throughout our discussions of the process is the pool does remain available while they're loading the spent fuel that's currently in the pool, but I am not aware of a long-term plan or even an intermediate-term plan to reserve the pool for you know, a measurable period of time or time after all the spent fuel is completely loaded into dry casks and has been relocated to the new IFSI. Correct. I, I think just want to know the time. Right. I think you're correct, Dave. And I think Mary has a reasonable question of what is the date that the spent fuel pool will be decommissioned? And that means the support equipment required to keep the fuel covered and cool in the pool no longer exists. Is that fair Next restatement, week. Mary? I think that's excellent. Thanks. I think you went to parochial school. <laughs> I, th I think what I've seen in, in Pat's um, thing is that by January next year, the pool will no longer be needed. And he just said tonight that it's going to be uh, quicker than that. Is that correct? Yeah, I, yeah, I said that the plan would be to get all fuel out of the pool by November. So that after that, it's not going to be needed for anything? <clears throat> Am I understanding? John, I mean, John, John, correct me, but there'll still be water in, in, the, uh, in the structures as we continue the, uh, the rest of the reactor vessel internal. Uh, some of that work, with the, especially with the greater than oh, class C yeah. loading, will still be underwater, obviously. Gotcha. I think Rich Rothstein has a question. Thank you. Um, I probably should have asked NRC this question at the March meeting presentation, but um, <clears throat> food for thought and for further discussion perhaps at future meetings. Forgetting about costs for a moment, is there any reason, Patrick, why once the spent nuclear fuel pool is going to be demolished, but if there were in this kind of interim zone where uh, in terms of the Russian doll scenario or other things that have been discussed or not discussed, why a, if there's going to be a problem with a cask, hypothetically, it could be a single cask MPC that had a problem for the sake of argument. So obviously you have a pool in the reactor building to hold a lot of assemblies for a lot of casks. Is there any reason, forget about the cost at the moment, why a single small pool to hold a canister 
uh, underwater deep enough, just in case there were a problem uh, for the IFC, uh, where it could be, let's say, next to the IFC, um, as a means for uh, keeping that, through the lack of better words, defective or problematic uh, multi-purpose canister underwater as if, it, um, you know, I mean, there might be some other issues putting that into water as opposed to an assembly, but conceptually, um, is that a possible, reasonable engineering scenario? I would have to ask our engineers, but I would think no, just from a security perspective and what the footprint is of the, of the, the protected area. Okay, thank you. Okay, carry on, Patrick. All right, I just gotta, I gotta do a quick change of screens so I can show you. I just wanna put this together uh, after the last um, fuel campaigns. It's about a three and a half minute, uh, four minute video. Uh, it just shows the process. So I'll just let this play uh, and hopefully everyone can hear it when it goes. not there yet. We're still seeing your slides. There you are? Yeah. Hold on. Sorry. I thought I switched the right screen. There we go. Now you should see a black screen. Is that right? Yeah, black right. screen. Correct. Yeah, there you go. Thanks. <laughs> No sound though. Muted. You still don't have any sound if you're intending it. Yeah, I don't know what's going on there. Um, I have it all the way up. What everything that's being said is actually on the screen. Okay. It is a stunning amount of equipment, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> Good luck with that. Patrick, that was kind of what I was alluding to before. If um, the, the mini pool outside near the pad, if you had to get those <laughs> out of a defective canister, kind of doing reverse engineering a little bit there to get them into a new undefective canister. Uh, but uh, I think the visual kind of was alluding to what I was trying to explain before or suggest. Yeah, I understand what you're saying, Rich. And that's that's actually, you know, like I said, that was from last campaign. So that's the old pad. Obviously, we don't have anything up on the new pad right now. So that's it's a different different footprint. Um, okay, so that I well, think you could have a pool by the new thing. Not inside the protected area, which is what it would necessarily need to be based on the size. Well, you, size you can expand the protected area. You can have security around. We don't deal with Rich uh, Grassy to see whether it's actual fact that security would not be possible. It could be a problem with thermal shock into a pool, who knows what. But as far as security, I think we need that looked into more. All right, I'll, I'll let Rich speak to that if he wants to during his presentation. He's got a pretty thorough presentation. Um, okay, so I am back to, I hope I'm back to my slides. Yeah, you are. Yep. Thank you. Well, with that, I will turn it over to, uh, to Matt Daly and John Drabinski from ERM uh, for their, uh, their uh, part of the presentation. Hey, Pat, before you do that, can I ask you a question? Absolutely. Um, can you go back to the slide that shows the money in the 2020 and the 2021? Yes. So just so I'm clear, I mean, it looks like, you know, in 2020, you guys were projecting, you know, basically... 100 million, I guess, in cost below what was in the, the trust fund? Uh, the actual cost that we, would, we were planning on spending or had projected to spend was that 101 with the final 1.031 uh, to complete to final license termination for a total cost of 1.132. We moved up work, which is what I referenced in the previous slide. Right. Um, and the actual cost for 277, the estimate to complete is 824 and a total cost is 1.101. So we've, we've, we've realized savings through some of that things I spoke to with the waste contracts and, and, uh, efficiencies and work is what we've looked at. So, so your estimate to complete is 824. And I think you said it was 881 that was in the trust fund right now. Yes. So got, as of December 31st, these are all as of December 31st numbers. So you've got a $60 million hedge. That's what it looks like from, from me reading these today too as well. Okay. Well, what about cost for inflation? How does that work? Uh, you got to understand there's a lot of uh, uh, contingency built into these numbers. So there's a, a pretty significant contingency built in with what we project. Um, but so there, there's there's room, and then there's obviously the financial requirements set forth in the AG's agreement that uh, we have to keep certain levels in the trust fund up through license termination, and then uh, until the ESFC is uh, uh, decommissioned. So of that sixty million dollar hedge, are you taking profit as part of the estimate as you go along, or do you take all of your profit at the end with what's left over? That's an excellent question that I could not give you the answer to off the top of my head. I, I, I don't believe. Because there's I, overhead that you're paying that's about, you're kind of reimbursing yourself for, I assume. I would assume as well, but I don't know offhand, honestly, Dave. Okay. Could we get, can we just note that as a question to get an answer for the next yeah, meeting? I'll, I'll, see what I, I'll see what I can find. I, I think we were told that profit was built in. Yeah, I, I assume that's a probably be the case, Mary, but I don't want to talk offhand and say that's not. If, if oh, I don't, that, that'll be another question. You'll get back. Yeah. For the list of questions. I think Jack Priest has his hand up. I do. I do. So, Dave, I read that table a little different than you did. I looked at the 1132 and compared it to the 881 and said, how is that gap covered? No, that's wrong, Jack. It, what Dave says, right, the 824 is what we project left to spend with 881 in the fund. Right. So what have you spent so far? Two I'm seven, looking at two, 277. 
Right, so 277 plus 824. Is 1101. Okay. And so when, we we got, eight, when we got the fund, there was 1.1 and change in it. Uh, I thought you said that the fund was 881. As of uh, December 31st, 2020. So when we got the fund, when it was turned over from uh, Entergy, it was 1.1. And I'd have to go back to my notes that we have, but it was over 1.1 when we got the fund. And if you go right, to the so you've taken 277 out so far, and you think you're going to spend another 824, and you got 881 left. Correct. And if you go to the filing, when I, when I put this up here, the filing actually has a more uh, elaborate burn down year by year. Okay. All right. All right. Go ahead, Pat. All right. I'm going to kick it over to, to my friends at ERM. Okay, thank you. This is Matt Daly speaking here, um, part of the LSP team with John Drabinski is also on this call. Thank you for giving us some time tonight. And what we'd like to do is kind of walk you through a submittal that's going to be going in by the end of this week to Mass DPH and the Mass Department of Environmental Protection. And we're calling it kind of an amended environmental site assessment work plan. And it's kind of a, <clears throat> it's the next step in the site characterization process of, of Pilgrim Station that's outlined in the settlement agreement. And essentially we're gonna show you in this slide and the next slide is kind of what is in this submittal that's, that's going in um, at the end of this week. And essentially there's almost really two parts to this, to this work plan submittal. The first part is kind of looking back at all of the site characterization activities that were completed in 2020 as well as spring 2021. So essentially uh, documenting all the samples that were collected, um, both radiological and non-radiological. Um, it describes the scope of what those samples were, what the methodologies for what those, how those samples were being collected. That includes you know, detailed maps of sampling locations, uh, detailed list of analytical testing uh, for, for each individual sample, uh, tables with regards to the number of samples that were collected um, and uh, so kind of moving down on this slide, um, consistent with the initial site assessment, uh, environmental site assessment work plan, um, the site was kind of broken up into different survey areas or areas of influence, areas of interest that were identified based on the historical records review during the historical site assessment and interviews with um, past uh, plant employees. And as far as all the radiological sampling that was completed, um, in 2020, it's essentially a, both a random um, sampling process that's governed by the MARSIM uh, approach that's out there. And there was also biased uh, samples that were collected where the field, field teams were saw uh, certain materials out there and decided to go ahead and sample those. So radiological sampling includes both random sampling per MARSIM as well as some biased sampling results. Uh, from a non-radiological standpoint, uh, those uh, soil and groundwater sampling testing activities are all focused on the areas of interest. So different areas of the site that had a historical use or history of activities that suggested there potentially could be a release to soil or groundwater from a non-radionuclide constituent. Those areas were specifically targeted for the uh, sampling of both soil and groundwater um, appropriately. And as far as, um, you know, just some statistics on some of the sampling that was completed in, in 2020, it was a total of 149 uh, radiological soil samples were analyzed out at the site. Uh, 82 soil samples were analyzed for non-radionuclide non uh, constituents. Um, from a groundwater standpoint, there was uh, a number of uh, temporary grab groundwater samples that were collected across the site, upwards of about 25. And then uh, six additional monitoring wells have been installed at the site um, since initial site characterization activities have occurred. Uh, sediment samples were collected and analyzed, as well as just some, some building and structure samples to help identify waste characterization for offsite disposal activities. Um, so the second, second bullet on this slide is, is really kind of, again, looking back at past uh, activities as far as what samples have already been collected and analyzed and specifically the results of those samples. Um, so the results are kind of broken up um, from a radiological and a non-radiological standpoint. 
And from a radiological standpoint, um, the analysis kind of follows the Marsden classification process where the different survey areas spread out across the site have been preliminary classified at this point based on what the data is indicating. And we'll go through some of that information on a further slide here. And uh, from a non-radiological standpoint, uh, these activities are, are in the state of Massachusetts. So we're following the Massachusetts contingency plan. And um, so we're basically collecting samples of soil groundwater and then comparing those concentrations to what the state of Massachusetts has identified as quote unquote reportable concentrations, where if your sample comes back at a concentration above a reportable concentration, then you have to formally report that to the state. And that essentially formally brings the site into the Massachusetts contingency plan where those regulations uh, will basically follow a certain subset of activities um, that go through full site characterization, uh, assessment and remediation as necessary till, till final closure of those, of those activities. And as far as the activities in 2020, um, there was essentially, uh, you know, obviously a fair amount of plans that were developed in advance of doing all this work. Those plans contemplated a certain number of samples across the site, soil and groundwater, both radiological and non-radiological. And there were some instances of equipment limitation where Equipment, equipment couldn't get to depth, uh, samples couldn't be collected. So as part of what we do, what we're doing in this report is to essentially call out those specific gaps in data um, that were originally contemplated to be collected, but for one reason or another, were not collected as part of this initial campaign. And we certainly are gonna go back and, 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 and get those samples. So we can go to the next slide, Patrick. Okay, so this, um, this is essentially the second phase of the environmental uh, site assessment work plan submittal. And this is all kind of forward looking uh, activities with regards to the continued iterative site characterization of the Pilgrim site. So number one on this slide is again, what the, it's, it's gonna include work plans to basically go back out there to collect those data gaps that were not able to be collected during that initial site characterization activity in 2020 in 2021. And essentially that's going to look like it's probably about 10 more monitoring wells that are going to be installed out, out at the site. So there was, I think, 23 already, and we just put in another six, and then we'll have another 10. So there'll be, you know, up to upwards of about 40 wells on the site in the next couple of months total. Um, there'll be sampling activities associated with those wells as well. Um, for the MCP program, those are the exceedances that were identified as part of that initial site characterization. Uh, the report kind of formally brings those exceedances um, into the MCP program. I believe the state um, has issued their notice of responsibility letter to HDI, and that essentially starts the clock under the MCP program um, for kind of commencing the non-radiological site characterization activities for those exceedances under the MCP program. Uh, we also have in the amended ESA work plan, um, a, a groundwater monitoring plan, kind of what our thoughts are um, as far as, you know, groundwater monitoring activities over the next six months. And there's a couple of different monitoring programs already out at the site. We've got the NEI 0707 groundwater protection program, uh, where that's a, a quarterly sampling program for every one of those 23 wells. Plus there are a couple of other wells that are being sampled on a monthly basis. And those samples are all being split with uh, mass DPH. And we've got, um, there's groundwater sampling that's part of the site's uh, groundwater discharge permit for the on-site treatment of sanitary wastewater. And what we're gonna do under this uh, monitoring plan is um, do a comprehensive groundwater uh, elevation measurement uh, event, a gauging event, where we're gonna go out to all the existing wells plus all these new wells that are just been installed and the, and the additional 10 that will be going in here in the next couple of months and essentially do a, a comprehensive round to better understand groundwater flow directions across the site by pulling in all those additional new data points. And we're also looking at doing some additional sampling um, of the non-radiological parameters in, in a number of those wells to kind of confirm uh, to us what we think is going on at the site because we've got essentially one set of samples at this point in time, and we want to collect another set of samples at a minimum in about uh, fall timeframe. 
As far as the uh, amended ESA work plan, one of the big gaps obviously is um, with all the buildings that are out there right now and all the high radiological uh, areas inside those buildings. There's just a physical limitation to get in those buildings and to assess soil underneath those buildings. So the ESA essentially acknowledges that that's a data gap right now. And based on the schedule that the site has, those, um, those areas should be open up and ready for sampling in about the 2024 timeframe. And I think that's consistent with what Pat was showing on the waterfall. So that will essentially, that'll be a big effort in the 2024 timeframe to get samples for both radiological and non-radiological non uh, parameters underneath those, those slabs of the power block. And the plan also includes um, some of the initial plans for site characterization of the additional um, licensed areas that were not included in this first go around. So these are the land parcels that are essentially south of Rocky Hill Road and there's an additional parcel that's on the waterfront. I think they call it the former Greenwood Estate. So we've got in this submittal, um, you know, detailed drawings that show where those samples are gonna go in, uh, listing what types of soil samples, wh what types of groundwater samples, and how they'll be analyzed for both radiological and non-radiological parameters. And it's essentially, you know, by the, the part one of this report, kind of looking back at all the data that's already been collected and tabulating that and putting it into plans, as well as this, uh, slide that we're looking at here, all of our next iteration of site characterization activities, um, we feel that um, DPH and MassDEP will have a pretty robust um, set of documents in front of them that they'll be able to go through and do their review and comment as, uh, that's consistent with the settlement agreement. And our understanding is once we receive comments back from um, those two agencies, then essentially there's a 30-day clock that starts where uh, Holtec and, and HDI would, um, you know, get back their response to comments uh, back on that. So um, we think it's a pretty, pretty robust submittal with a fair amount of information in there, and um, both DEP and, and DPH will have um, a lot of information to kind of go through in this report. So the next couple slides, if you can go to the next slide, Patrick, we'll should just kind of go through some of the key, key findings from this, the first phase. And obviously this is all, everything that's north of, of Rocky Hill Road, going back to that initial site characterization. These are the different uh, sur survey areas as defined um, by kind of following the MARSIM approach to site characterization. And these are essentially showing you what these preliminary classifications are according to MARSIM based on the data that's been obtained from the first set of initial site characterization activities. Um, so again, this, these, this represents both random sampling locations as well as bias sampling locations. And from a MARSIM standpoint, um, class one would be, you know, areas where there's gonna be concentrations in soil and or groundwater that are gonna be above the derived concentration guideline level. And that's a, a concentration that equates to the state of Massachusetts 10 millirem per year dose criteria. So we've got at this point, obviously the, what we call the, the NPA, the nuclear or the North protected area, that's the area in yellow. That's where the current power block is. Um, right now that's retaining a class one uh, classification. That's also where a lot of those slabs are that will have to be basically sampled underneath there. But from a conservative standpoint, keeping a, keeping a class one, uh, a, Marsum classification for that area at this point in time. And then the outer areas um, are showing as class three based on the results of that initial site characterization activity. And for the work that's planned for south of Rocky Hill Road, those additional parcels, um, the goal will be essentially to do a similar type of investigation following Marsum to ultimately come up with Marsum classifications for those perimeter land areas uh, that are outside the footprint of these colored areas we're looking at on this slide. Patrick, can you go to the next slide? Um, so this has uh, essentially a list of all of the non-radiological results that were above um, the reportable concentrations and were uh, communicated to the state of Massachusetts on April 21st um, in, on, according to the MCP program. So the table on the left 
is essentially um, results of soil that were above the RCS1, that's reportable concentration for soil classified as type one. That's the soil um, reportable classification applicable to, to Pilgrim Station. And what we're showing you here are the results of five individual PFAS um, chemicals. And you can see um, the RCS1 value in milligrams per kilogram and the exceedance value that we had and, and the, the location where that came from. And I'll show you on a map in here in a minute where this came from. Um, and we just want to call out that for this specific soil sample, the laboratory was not able to analyze the sample below the reportable concentration value. So these were actually non-detects or essentially the lab could not quantify a positive detection above the value that's listed in this table. But when you do a comparison of that value to the reportable concentration, it's higher than that reportable concentration. So we've made the decision that this is something that needs to be reported. It needs to be evaluated more with some groundwater uh, wells uh, going in and around this location to better understand if, if this detection or really a non-detect is actually um, you know, something that is contributing to groundwater at the site. So this would be something that's gonna go forward through the MCP process to better understand you know, what is up with this PFAS result. Is it a, is it a realist, is it a, real sample contributing to a groundwater problem, it'll work its way through the MCB process. On the right hand side, we've got a list of um, compounds that were detected in groundwater across the site that were above the RCGW1, which is the applicable groundwater standard for, for Pilgrim Station. And you can see PFAS, we've got that listed as, as, the, as the first one. And that was an actual positive detection. So the lab told us there was, there was PFAS in that water sample. The standard is 20. That's also the drinking water standard. And the detection limits were, the detections at the two wells specifically was 37 nanograms per liter and 32 nanograms per liter. So just kind of slightly above that drinking water standard. The rest of these compounds in groundwater were, are, are all metals. Uh, arsenic, vanadium, lead, antimony, beryllium, cadmium, nickel, and thallium. Many of these metals we believe are attributed to how some of these grab groundwater samples were collected. Uh, it's essentially going into, um, you know, down to the water table with some drilling equipment and collecting a one-time water sample without putting in a permanent well. And at this site, that can result in some water that's got a lot of suspended sediments or turbidity in it. And metals can often adhere themselves to those, to, to those suspended sediments. Um, so what we've done at the site is where we were starting to see some of these metals at very, very low concentrations, just right above the reportable concentration. And you have to think there's, we're not, we don't have it on the slide, but there was a lot of soil data collected from metals. And we didn't see any metals above any kind of detections well below the reportable concentrations in soil. Um, so there was a bunch of uh, about six wells that were placed at the site to put in permanent wells that would allow us to collect uh, like a traditional low flow groundwater sample. And once we did that, we saw a lot of these metals um, essentially were showing up well less than that reportable concentration. There was a couple locations where we had those turbid groundwater samples, but we were unable to get in a monitoring well due to underground obstructions and limitations with the drilling equipment. So given that these were basically about, these were 120 days, you know, understanding of these concentrations, 120 days after um, CDI and HDI became aware of them and we weren't able to get those wells in, then those, all these metals went in through that formal uh, release notification to the state of Massachusetts on that April 21st timeframe. And similar to the soil and those, and that working its way through the MCP process, all of these metals that you see here on the table on the right-hand side, those will all essentially formally start to um, 
work their way through the phase one, phase two, phase three program under the Massachusetts Contingency Plan to understand the source, the nature, the extent of these metals, and then identify remediation needs as necessary. You go to the next slide, Patrick. Okay, so here's a map that's kind of just showing you, um, you know, it's got a couple different data layers on this map. Um, one is kind of showing where all the samples have been collected uh, already as far as these, this initial iter iteration of site characterization at the Pilgrim site. And we're also showing you kind of spatially where these exceedances that we just talked through, where they were located. So the first thing I'll direct you to is the blue uh, text box kind of in the top left-hand section of this aerial photograph. Um, that was a soil boring. That's where those uh, five PFAS compounds in soil were identified at a non-detection level, but that non-detection level was above the reportable concentration. So again, that, that sample right there was formally notified to the state of Massachusetts. Then we have the other ones are all the groundwater. Those are all the ones we've got here with the red dot. Um, those are the ones where we had the two ones that had PFAS because we know most people are gonna be interested in that would be the one that was closest to the uh, intake canal. It's monitoring well 201. Um, and there are several other monitoring wells very close to monitoring well 201 where PFOS was not detected above that drinking water standard, which is the RCGW1 standard. So it was, a, it was one location um, that had two sample results above that drinking water standard, but other wells in that area didn't, didn't show anything above the standard. The other well that had the PFOS was kind of the most southern well, the southern red dot you see on the map, um, a new well that was just installed that had a sample of PFOS that was above the reportable concentration. And then all the other red dots are essentially those metals um, that were detected in groundwater. And we think a lot of that is attributed to the sampling technology and as part of um, the activities that are in this uh, amended ESA work plan as far as future work activities that we're proposing we're gonna do. Uh, we do have the installation of additional monitoring wells spatially in those areas where we have those red dots so that we can get you know a, a traditional monitoring well um, constructed in the subsurface developed appropriately and then sampled via low flow sampling techniques to get some more metal sampling and again that those activities would be kind of following the mcp process hey, matt this is jack Yes. So you um, mentioned drinking water standard several times in your presentation. These, these, to be clear, these are not drinking water, public drinking water wells. There are not, there is not a uh, close drinking water intake for those wells, correct? That's correct. That's correct. So right. you're just using that uh, numerical value as your standard. Yes, exactly. Yeah, unless you're a lobster, Jack, you know. <laughs> That's correct, Jack. Under the statute, uh, groundwater in Massachusetts uh, characterized in certain um, uh, characterizations, and this area is characterized as drinking water, even though there's no drinking water wells at this location. It's based on geology more than anything else, but you're absolutely yeah. It, yeah. It's a really good aquifer, and so it's considered groundwater one. Thank you, Drew. Like, I had a question actually on, on the 201. Do you think there's any relationship between the tritium that's found near that well and PFAS by any chance? Uh, um, I'm pretty, pretty, pretty doubtful. The, um, yeah. the, you know, tritium is something you would see in relation in this case to, uh, you know, nuclear uh, power. The PFAS is, you know, to our experience, not linked to that. It's. Yeah, what, I wasn't it's, so much thinking that it would be related to the the um, same chemistry of it, but more to the leak that caused the tritium. You know what I mean? If it could be part of that same um, event, if it if we could call it an event for the lack of better description. Yeah. Again, un unlikely. Um, I certainly. I, I guess anything's possible, but unlikely is not reason to think of that. It's not. Uh, you know, PFAS is in a lot of things, so I guess it's not um, inconceivable. 
that it is in some building product or something that you know could have been contacted by some tritium water i guess but i mean you really see it's pfas in fire foams you know if they extinguish the fire out there with foam that'd be one of the more obvious things you'd look for it's pretty prevalent we're seeing it uh you know in a lot of places it's used as flame retardant in you know furniture and clothing so um we're seeing it in an awful lot of places the numbers you're seeing out there uh you know the 37 it are the kinds of numbers that we do see in other places not associated with nuclear power generation and in some cases you know not even associated with um to our knowledge with fire foam the message the message i heard in the presentation is that they're not a hundred percent sure that they need to do continued monitoring to uh, quantify and confirm what they saw on these um, samples. Yeah, so as we, you know, um, as Matt has talked about, when we look for folks to do assessments of properties like this, we establish different standards they have to um, meet through their work and they have to notify us if they find an exceedance uh, of those standards. In this case, you heard Matt reference GW1 and uh, soil one. And what that points to is as Gerard mentioned, this is a high quality aquifer. So we essentially hold the LSPs like Matt and John uh, to notifying if they find a concentration of a contaminant that um, exceeds the numbers that we would be looking for in a residential location. So these are uh, the most conservative uh, notification criteria. And that's why when we talk about PFAS in this case, we make reference to groundwater because in this case, the same standard applies for drinking water and groundwater. Uh, luckily, we don't have a drinking water source anywhere near here, um, but it does kind of give you a sense of the level of contamination. And in the case of these metals and the PFAS, uh, these are not, uh, you know, really high levels, but they do exceed our uh, criteria for notification. I don't know, Gerard, if you want to uh, expand or do a better job on that, but I'd certainly welcome uh, No, I think he hit on it. Yep, it's a high yield aquifer, so we look at that as a potential water supply source in the in the future and so we hold them to the same standard as existing water supply sources um, and, and one thing to remember too especially with this PFAS is these numbers we're talking about the 37 it's parts per trillion you know so it's it's really really not that high and uh, um, to have one well that has it the next well that doesn't isn't too surprising but as you go through the MCP process what they're going to need to do is try to identify what the source might be and the extent of the contamination and figure out what needs to be done to address it. Yeah, that's exactly why I raised the issue about whether it could be coming from the same leaky building kind of thing, not, not, to, uh, you know, not to get into the, the heavy details of it. But maybe we should try to catch up on our schedule, so I'll shut up. Uh, question for Mr. Daly. Is Mr. Daly taking questions? Yeah, I think we got one more slide to get through. And then we can I'll wait till the end. Okay. Thank you. Okay, just, um, just kind of quick summary on key findings to date. Again, it's an iterative process. Um, we've got more site characterization to do out there, but these are just kind of a summary of what we're seeing at this point in time on the key findings of that initial activities. So, um, so from a non-radiological standpoint, again, kind of key finding is just as we talked through here, we had a couple of, we had some soil, really one location, and we had uh, se several locations of groundwater um, where we had those exceedances, which were formally communicated per the 120-day release notification. Those were, those were reported on April 21st to the agency. And again, they'll be, um, I believe they already have done this, is issue their notice 
of responsibility, which then formally kicks this site into the MCP program. Uh, those numerous metals, as we've talked through in groundwater, uh, we believe largely those are going to be attributed to tur turbidity uh, and the sampling technique. And, you know, we're, as we talked through, we've got plans in this document um, that the agencies will be looking at for more monitoring wells in those locations um, to better understand those metals. Um, we've got the PFAS in soil, which was, again, non-detect by the, by the laboratory. Um, but again, it's that detection limit was over, over that reportable concentration. Um, and just being conservative and transparent, we figured better to report than, than say it's not an issue at that site and we'll, we'll, we have to go through more work to, to really understand what's going on up at that location with the soil. Um, I think this is uh, number four where positive detections were identified. Um, you know, it's our feeling again, the concentrations are, are pretty low um, and the values are slightly just above those reportable concentrations. And essentially with the data at, at this point in time, um, we're not seeing any, you know, significant soil contamination or significant groundwater plumes um, that are going to suggest active remediation. But, you know, we've got to work through the MCP process. Um, but that's at least, you know, kind of a, an initial um, take from the data that we're seeing at this point in time. Um, and then as from, as from the non-radiological findings, again, no significant soil contamination was identified with all those samples that were out there. Um, and from a groundwater perspective, um, the radiological groundwater data that was collected during this initial site characterization, um, I think, confirms our site understanding and site conditions that are understood through that NEI 0707 groundwater protection program. Um, and again, just lastly here, as we've talked through, um, characterization is, a, is an iterative process, and the submittal that's going on, uh, that's going in this week, um, includes plans uh, about you know, kind of what that next phase of site characterization along that iterative path line uh, is going to look like for some of these areas that we've already looked at, as well as the areas on the south side of, of Rocky Hill Road, those additional perimeter land areas. So I think that's the last slide, so we can open it up to comments. Hi, right, Mr. Smith. Uh, through the chair, thank you. A question for the good Mr. Daly. Um, I uh, noted that uh, in, in the map showing all of the wells, the uh, Fukushima response wells, uh, they, they, they weren't shown on the map. Um, right. And I just questioned, um, are they uh, probably not suitable, but that's not up to me to judge. But is, is it a case of they're not suitable or they have uh, since been deactivated and they're plugged at this time? That's the so, question. Yeah. So yeah, the Fukushima wells um, were basically installed at the site in order to obtain a very high yield of water that could be used for an emergency situation. Um, so those wells are pretty deep and they have a very long well screen. Um, and so from a site characterization from environmental standpoint, uh, those would probably not be the best wells to understand presence or absence of, you know, radiological impacts or non-radial impacts that have, you know, found their way to the groundwater associated with plant activities. So um, the monitoring wells that are across the water table are kind of probably the best, um, you know, wells to confirm or deny presence or absence of contamination versus those deeper Fukushima wells. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, the second question is the... Um the switch yard, which has been in existence since prior to the uh, uh, Pilgrim Nuclear Power Station, probably back in 1966, 67, um, is, is not part of the site. It, it belongs to Eversource, I understand. Yeah. Uh, is it subject to uh, sampling and, uh, and review as to a source of uh, possible contaminants? It is. The switch yard is in the scope of the initial site characterization activities. Um, so there were samples collected from the switch yard. There were groundwater samples collected and as, as well as uh, new monitoring wells that were installed just immediately downgrading the switch yard. Um, as far as the, you know, moving those activities forward through the MCP process, um, there's there's language in the settlement agreement um, about the timing of that based on the different owners. 
I don't have that at the tip of my fingers, but it, it, to answer your question, it has been characterized initially part of this, this first campaign. Okay, as always, thank you, Mr. David. Hey, Matt, you may want to mention we are the company that did install the Fukushima wells too, so we were out there when we were installed. Yes. Yep. And would you describe what that is, please, now that you've said it five times? What are the Fukushima wells? So Fukushima wells were essentially um, after, in response to the events over in Japan, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission um, came up with an initiative for regulations where each plant in the United States had to identify a, a, the ability to basically um, get a water source so that you could put out, you know, an event such as what they had at Fukushima. Um, so for Pilgrim Station, um, you know, looking at trying to get a large source of water on site, and you could not rely on, let's say, the town because you had to assume that there was no infrastructure to bring that water in. And using seawater was not an option due to compatibility. And Paul Smith may probably knows more about that than I do. Um, so it was identified as groundwater was essentially could be used as an emergency supply to generate a body of water to, to you know, put out a, a significant fire at the site in response to like a Fukushima type of event where it, all of the infrastructure has been essentially degraded due to some natural disaster. So those wells were, they were basically drilled, they were tested and they've never been turned on. Um, they're located to the south of the turbine building um, and they're probably about 90 feet deep below ground surface. The water table at the site, in that area is probably around 15 feet below ground surface. Um, and there's a really high yield aquifer from about 60 to 90 feet below ground surface. And that's where the Fukushima water supply wells are essentially strategically constructed to remove water from that deep zone. Um, so again, that's much deeper than what we have in and around the plant where you might have impacts. Thank you. So I think, uh, so yeah. Matt, that is all correct. It was, uh, they called it a be beyond design criteria response or something like that and essentially got to post Fukushima, we all thought that we covered everything that might happen and then NRC saw that maybe uh, the design didn't. But I do think that in addition to those wells, Matt, I, I, there were plans and I think it did come to fruition for some ocean water um, as well. I don't know if that got scrapped, but there were plans to pull pumps out by sort of pulling in a float system. John could, conf could confirm whether that ever happened, John Moylan, but I remember seeing that and we authorized that. So I think there may even be plans beyond those wells. Yeah, I think I, think I actually appealed that, Dave. But Dave Nichols has a, um, has a question. Great, thanks, Brian. Uh, Matt, I think I, you know, it was a pretty technical presentation. Thank you, I think I followed some of it. Um, but I was interested in the end when you talk about radiological contamination and you said that there was you know, no significant radiological contamination identified and understanding, I guess, naturally occurring radioactive material or um, background and, and low levels that are barely detectable. I, I would still be surprised if you found any radioactive material outside of where it should be. So could you just talk a little bit more about that did you find radioactive material, but it was just at such a low level that it wasn't a concern or did you just not find anything, whether it's significant or insignificant, I guess? Yeah, good question. Um, so the, the two main radionuclides that were detected would have been cobalt-60 and cesium-137. Um, and from a cesium-137 standpoint, when the site was operational, they had done a fair amount of data collection activities to understand what the local background of cesium-137 is, and that's coming from historic weapons testing activities. Um, so there was, there was cesium-137 cesium that was in soil, but it was consistent within a range of concentration that they've seen at this site for many, many, many years that's attributed to kind of past um, you know, uh, activities that were unrelated to plant operation. 
Um, cobalt 60 was pretty much less than background. And the way all of the radionuclide um, samples for soil were being kind of assessed against, um, they're being assessed against that derived concentration guideline level, which is essentially uh, the concentration that equates to that 10 millirem per year dose standard, which is essentially the dose standard that's, that the state of Massachusetts has for, um, for essentially closure of the site, release of the site. So then if you went like 10 miles up the coast and did soil samples there, you'd find roughly the same thing then? It's not unique to that location, what you were Correct. finding? right. Okay. Thank you. Um, yes, I have spent um, quite a bit of material on uh, the history of contamination and assessment that was done by the state and by independent um, analysts. And also I sent information that the licensee continuously had a we didn't do it approach to anything found. Miraculously, I guess China had uh, smart bombs way back where the contaminant happened to hit the indicator station, but not the station samples that you would not expect to see that contamination. So I really, are you, are you buying that? Did that statement indicate that whatever the licensee said, we didn't do it, he did it? Are you taking that at face value? Because I think some of oh, that I could have sent you much more of uh, samples that were taken from indicator stations and from um, control stations uh, don't jive. And so I would find that very disappointing if you were just doing a reading of the licensee's self-interest report. No, again, 149 soil samples have been analyzed at the site and um, those results are documented in this amended ESA uh, work plan. Mm -hmm. And those will be submitted to, you know, Jack and, and DJ on this, they were on this ND cap Yeah, you panel. took the samples, you found it, but it sounded like there was a footnote, but oh no, this was due to um, military bombs or what have you, test bombs. We're not saying, well, this could be due to a lot of things and it's there. There's also 40 years worth of annual environmental assessment reports. That I've read them all. Yep, yeah, and, and as you know, they'll have a table where they've done water, grass, soil, mussels, lobster, fish. Mm -hmm. So the I think what, to paraphrase Matt, the, that background level is very well understood and documented. All right, we're running a little behind tonight. I'm gonna to move on to the uh, report from the IWG, okay? Yeah, I got that. I just want to make sure Mary's question was answered there. I, I kind of, Mary, did I, did I help no, yeah, no, your the, understanding? The question, the question was, yep. uh, I thought I heard the statement that cesium-137, for example, was detected, but that was due to, um, um, test bombs or what have you. And my question was, are you accepting the fact that it, it wasn't due to licensees actions and it was due to some military action that was taken? And step number two, if it's there, then it deserves I would hope and not be written on to see, could this be due to leakage? Could this due to previous uh, air contamination that has been driven down into the soil or whatnot? That it is an indicator 
to look further and not just buy, oh, this wasn't due to them. Yeah, there are results of cesium-137 that were above the background that are attributed to past plant operations that are getting carried forward through the Marsden process. So oh. um, there, are, there are detections of cesium-137 above background that are going to move forward through the Marsden okay. process. That answers the question. What, what we're looking at and what will be remediated is that activity cannot contribute to more than 10 millirem in a year. Mm -hmm. So Correct. when we're reviewing what's presented to us, I look at what the lab, uh, their certified lab results they provide to us. We'll look at their, we'll look at, I'll just look at the numerical value first, right? and say, okay, what's an anomaly? What's, what's off of the baseline? And then we'll use that and that iterative process to work with ERM to say, hey, we think you need to do more samples here. And that's a good opportunity for us to take a split sample and say, yep, we got the same results as that, um, that the laboratory that's providing the data to ERM. So, you know, this first round of testing is kind of like, I say it's like the 50,000 foot view of the site. It gives mm -hmm. us some indication of where we want to look harder. But, but really when it comes down to, it's really to come down to that 2024 time period where we're looking beneath the reactor building, beneath the turbine building, mm -hmm. the discharge canal to say, hey, once the building's removed and the surface structures are removed, what's left in the ground? before we turn that site over. Did that help? Yeah, that's, that's great, thank you. And then you'll be doing the area between Rocky Hill Road and 3A. Yes. So the map, the map indicated only from Rocky Hill Road to the bay, so and that, not the rest of the property. It's my understanding that what they're evaluating now through this part of the assessment is all the licensed property. Right. Yeah, you're right, you're right, Jack. And, and to, to Mary's question, I think Matt referenced it a little bit earlier he, when he was talking about the south side of Rocky Hill Road. That's what, I, I guess for lack of a better way to put it, we'll call the phase two site characterization. That's what we'll be mobilizing, I believe starting in late June, we'll start being over there doing sampling and, and, and that process. Uh, along with, I think, the Greenwood Estate that uh, Matt referenced as well, which I think we have is like... Okay, the south side is between 3A and Rocky Hill. I, I don't know what I'm, north or south or west. Yeah, yeah, I think we use Plant North. So Plant North is the, the <laughs> building, the, 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 the reactor building looking towards your house, Mary. <laughs> oh, I look there <laughs> every day. <laughs> okay, how are we doing now, Mary? We all set? Better. Can they hear me? We should. All right, can we move on to the IWG? All right, sure. So, uh, Dave Johnson, uh, Gerard Martin, and Seth Pickering. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So the IWG has been focusing its energies on the environmental site assessment that we all just heard a summary of. Uh, we continue to meet regularly with the whole tech folks um, to go over the work. And as you heard, we are expecting to have the uh, submittal of the ongoing work plan the end of May. So when we receive that, we will review it and uh, provide our comments, which will be routed through the Attorney General's office. And that's all laid out in the settlement agreement. So once we have developed our comments and issued them, as Matt mentioned, the whole tech folks will have 30 days to respond to them. So, you know, I think what you're hearing is that this is a, an iterative process and it's gonna be going on for quite some time. And because there are buildings and impediments and things out there that really do limit uh, the completeness of the work that is possible right now, it really does force this process to be 
kind of ongoing throughout the decommissioning as work occurs, as buildings are removed, as accessibility improves, and potentially uh, as activities may change the, the nature of the contamination out there. So those are the kinds of comments that'll be reflected in our comments when we issue them through the Attorney General's office. Additionally, we'll speak to the entire report, you know, what we saw in terms of uh, the sample results. We have been involved along the way in where the sampling occurred. So, you know, looking at the data will inform whether that was fully adequate. Um, you know, there was buy-in at the time the work was conducted on the adequacy of the groundwater and soil sampling plans. And now that we're seeing some data, we're gonna be able to uh, officially weigh in on the thoroughness of those plans uh, that have occurred thus far and what additional work, um, you know, the sample results or, or seeing those plans laid out on maps, what additional results of work we need to see. And that, um, you know, is work that we're gonna be doing over the next, um, you know, probably a month or month and a half or as long as it takes us to get our comments uh, and to the point that we wanna have them. Um, for Holtec to respond to. Also, as Matt mentioned, we have uh, on May 20th, we issued the Notice of Responsibility Letter. And that's our official letter that acknowledges the notification that the Holtec folks made that they had a, an exceedance of a notification criteria and that does start the clock. So uh, that is out there. I supplied that to uh, Co-Chair Dubois, and she is free to post that um, on the uh, INDICAP website so that anyone who wants to see that NOR will be free to take a look at that. Um, we just heard uh, the nature of the exceedances, so I won't um, get into that. And in addition, on May 20th, MassDP also issued a notice of noncompliance so a notice of responsibility letter is our affirmation that proper notification was made um, and that we've assigned a uh, notification tracking number and work's gonna commence. So uh, that differs from a notice of non-compliance, which is a form we identify uh, a violation. We had a minor violation after and a, a small asbestos abatement occurred. So back in February, the whole tech folks did a debris cleanup on a uh, high vac unit, condenser unit. And prior to having the space reoccupied, they did not complete the visual inspection. So the way our asbestos program works is you provide notification to MassDEP. You hire a licensed uh, asbestos abatement contractor that uh, all those things happened and the work gets done and that happened. Yeah, but before you reoccupy, you do a final inspection. That did not happen timely. Uh, it happened a couple of weeks after the um, asbestos abatement occurred. We look for it to happen sooner than that before reoccupation. So that is a citation that is in that notice of noncompliance. Also a document that I shared with Pine. So um, that uh, we can also get on the Indicap, um, you know, website or, or whatever other means we uh, we need to have uh, that visible to folks. So that is really the work we've been doing. Our, our report outs always kind of get uh, morphed into the updates you hear before we come on because we are working on the same stuff and that is primarily environmental site assessment. So um, before I roll on, do we have any questions on either the a notice of responsibility letter, the notice of non-compliance, uh, or anything you heard from uh, either Matt or me that, uh, or Jack that we can respond to. Or, uh, yeah, sure, Mary. Uh, yes, I sent a memo out today on the confidentiality section of the settlement and obviously sent it out in relation to a request 
that when the uh, end of May, the you received the ERM that we'd like to see it. Yeah, that's a reasonable request. Uh, we have encouraged Holtec to work through the end of CAP to find a way to make that readily available. Uh, we believe that to be public information. So, um, you know, I don't know if uh, Pat and his crew have been able to give any thought to how to do that, but- um, the, you know, the, Did you talk about the ESBA work plan, DJ? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I, believe, I believe that to be the case and uh, we'll be able to share, you know, anything that obviously doesn't fall under the, uh, the criteria of uh, uh, outline in the settlement agreement, which, you know, it's the, the, the proper disclosures. But for the most part, I, I would agree with you that a good portion of this is going to be publicly available. If not, um, what if not. isn't that we would see uh, a redacted document and explanation of why it was redacted? The section. Yep. Yeah, that's great because I think in that way, uh, you know, just like the NRC does it, you, you, you put a draft report out and then people look at it and they comment, and hopefully some will be helpful. Yeah, that, that uh, Mary, is the goal. And um, nice. so, you know, so uh, I'd encourage Pat to work with um, Pine and John, the chair and co-chair, to get that somehow routed through the Endicap so that that can be made available. And, you know, we have uh, talked with the whole tech folks about uh, making these kinds of documents available. And they've, uh, you know, we do have a settlement agreement that does lay out some aspects of confidentiality. And we've also talked with them about there's some techniques or certain things that uh, you know they view as business confidential that might you know hurt their um, their competitiveness in the decommissioning field or what have you. And uh, you know those nuggets are I would imagine are going to be pretty small in comparison to the the volume of data in this report. And I wouldn't I can't imagine a uh, any, you know, anything that would need to get redacted that would consequentially impact the view that we're all going to get of the adequacy of this assessment and the data that it's generating. Okay, that's great. Thanks for your efforts. Great, thank you. So, so the last thing I have to report out tonight is tonight will be my last Endicap meeting. Uh, I am going to be retiring after th uh, nearly 37 years of uh, working for the Commonwealth, and I'll uh, miss the work. Uh, <laughs> thanks, I'm Pine. I'll miss Pine. I talk a lot to Pine on various projects, but I'll miss the work. Uh, it's been a wonderful career. I'll miss this project. It's been a really fun way to wrap up a lot of work and, and get exposed to some new things. Um, it's been interesting to watch the growth of the Endicap, and uh, I'm encouraged by the ongoing interest by the citizens and the folks who call in and watch us every every couple of months. So I encourage everyone to stay engaged and to continue this important work. And I know that, uh, you know, there's some, a lot of folks here very interested. And I can tell you that um, in passing the baton to Seth Pickering, uh, who will replace me on the interagency work group and as Secretary Theoretes designee, uh, you are in very good hands. Seth Pickering and I have worked together for decades, and Seth has a lot of experience in air quality, a lot of experience in power generation. He has uh, worked for the Commonwealth uh, Mass DP for many years. He worked in uh, energy conservation through the CDCEC uh, for, for several years. He's worked at, working in the uh, power generation field, uh, for uh, gas and also nuclear. So I've kind of think I've not left Seth a heck of a lot to say, but, uh, but if he does feel like saying anything, please do. Uh, otherwise, thank you, Seth. And, uh, and thanks everyone for listening to me for all these years. Oh, thank you for your work. You're too young to retire. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, he's not, Mary. Congratulations. <laughs> Dave, and I just want to add that I got to know Seth Pickering many decades ago, late 80s, 90s, when uh, John Winkler was heading up the Southeast DEP uh, 
air quality group and uh, Seth came on board and had a chance to interface with him uh, when I was a lot younger too. And uh, glad to see him formally connecting with the Endicap in this capacity. Thanks, Rich. Thanks, DJ. Uh, I, I look forward to working with the group. Uh, I got a lot of uh, information to come up to speed on. So uh, please indulge me uh, when I ask questions. I will ask uh, a lot of questions, uh, especially if I don't, you know, know exactly what we're talking about. So uh, uh, I look forward to um, working with everyone. It's been good to have the chance to sit in on a few of these meetings. And uh, um, as Rich has pointed out, there are a number of you um, that I've worked with in the past, and I look forward to working with you more in the future. Seth, welcome aboard, and Dave, I, I think speaking for the entire group, we wish you all the best in your retirement, and certainly going to miss, miss your um, level of professionalism and your input. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Uh, uh, Dave, can you, can you get Seth to give me his cell phone number? I'm sure, sure he will. Absolutely. Thank you. Or, Oops, sorry. Rich, okay. Rich Grassy. Rich. Am I on? Yeah, I can hear you. Hey, Dave, congratulations. Good luck. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, John and uh, Pine. Basically, what I'm going to do is give you a <clears throat> 10 minute overview of the ISFSI ISFSI security. I've got a couple of slides. Um, basically, I come at this as a uh, Plymouth, town of Plymouth representative. And I had talked to a number of people in the town of Plymouth and they asked me if the, is there storage of the nuclear waste going to be around long, and I didn't have any answers. I, I referred them all to Mary Lampert. Um, and then they asked me, is it safe and secure? And I said, to be honest with you, I think so, but I, I'm not sure, let me go look at it. So basically I uh, conducted a, a, a very general site survey. I visited the site, I spoke with uh, Brian and uh, Dave, who are part of the security complement from Plymouth uh, Pilgrim site. Um, I, I compiled my notes and, and essentially I, I said, uh, there's no, normally I, do, I conduct security audits or I did, I've ha had an engineering firm where I did security designs for large scale nuclear, chemical, and biological sites, uh, basically worldwide, mostly in the U.S. And so I decided to provide a slide uh, presentation to you that would show my observations of looking at security. And, and, and it's all based on professional experience, judgment, as I mentioned, the meetings, the on-site survey. There wasn't a survey, but I, I was not a maid of... I did not get inside the ISFSI. Um, I met with Brian and David and uh, Patrick. It was a wonderful visit. I really enjoyed it. They were totally forthcoming uh, and transparent, except when I got to safeguards information and then it was uh, no, no comprendo, however it goes. So basically, these are observations. They're observations that are well, well informed. And just to give an example of audits that I've conducted in my life, the last audit I did, um, it, essentially it's a get out of jail audit. I was called by Johnson & Johnson to go out to San Diego to a vaccine our research and development a uh, million square foot building. And I was told by the vice president to meet him in a hotel on, on, before I went there. And at the hotel, he gave me a letter that said, I want you to break into my site. And here's a letter if you get caught, signed by him, the vice president. So I conducted a number of these audits in my life. And by the way, in San Francisco, uh, excuse me, San Diego, I was able to blow by the guards without any problem whatsoever. But I want to preface that comment with, if you ever ask me to do this at Pilgrim ISFSI, I will refuse. It's too dangerous. It's a very secure site, very. 
So anyway, let's let's go on. Um, the second slide just shows the ISI, FSI locations in the United States. It's broken down by those that are in, uh, under a general license. That's those that are licensed at or away from a reactor, those that are standalone IFSI, and the others are future IFSI. That uh, box down in the lower left indicates those indicate things that I mentioned. 34 states in the United States have ISFSIs. To my knowledge, and I, I'm I can be corrected, Mary, to my knowledge, and I believe as reported by the NRC, none have been attacked, none. <clears throat> Next slide. Here's a slide showing Yankee Row and Connecticut Yankee. And I believe because they were designed and constructed prior to 9-11, and 9-11, during that, after 9-11, the NRC came out with totally revised security regulations and guidelines. So you see Yankee Row and Connecticut Yankee essentially having the same double fence and the concrete pad, but security is not nearly as robust as the ISFSI at Pilgrim. Next slide. Now here is a, a slide on the left-hand side, you'll see essentially it's a landscape site plan, all the yellow markings on the outside. <laughs> there are arborvitae or whatever planting they decide to put between Rocky Hill and the ISFSI. Basically that's just an obscurant. The further you go into the site, You'll come into a security barrier, which is a vehicle, VBIED barrier, vehicle-borne integrated or, uh, explosive device. And then uh, from there, you go in even further. There's a haul road that comes in on the northern part of the uh, ISFSI. There's a security building. There's a pad. And then down at the bottom right, there is a building which is going to be retained after decommission decommissioning and that is going to be the location of the security administration the building on the gr in green and the in, in the middle of the pad area is the security control room and that's where the supervisor will be in addition to i don't know how many people i would estimate two to three security guards that will be on the interior and exterior of the site 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. The NRC requires a armed response force. Is that a dog? <laughs> the NRC requires an a, a armed response force within 10 minutes. The reason I've been concerned about this ISFSI is as soon as Patrick and the site vice president and everybody with CDI Holtec completes the commissioning, all that's going to be left is this ISFSI that you see in the picture here. That's it. So my concern was now that everybody's gone from the site except security, how does the town of Plymouth fit into this overall plan and how is it going to be implemented and how does Holtec CDI cooperate and, and coordinate with the town of Plymouth? And I'll get to that as we go, go on. There's a, just for, for clarification, uh, if Patrick, you can point out the ISFSI in the upper right, upper right picture. Thank you. No, not that one. The low, the uh, that's it. The big ISFSI, they call it from the security, and the upper <coughs> pad. is called a little P. I thought that's kind of cute. But anyway, um, as Patrick indicated, the fuel campaign is starting up, and the. Uh, I asked the security people, you're going to have two ISFSIs operational at the same time, because at some point, once the fuel campaign starts, they're going to be taking the fuel from the spent fuel pool 
putting it into dry cast and moving it up to this, uh, I'll call it Rocky Hill Road, ISFSI. And then within two weeks, they'll be taking the cast from the lower, I call the uh, big, I, I, uh, big P, I hate these terms. Uh, they'll be taking the casts that are in the lower and they'll be going up to the upper and essentially there'll be 65 casts. I believe there's 63 containing the spread fuel rods and then uh, the waste to waste cats, the casts. Next slide. So the upper ISFSI, in terms of security, I've mentioned it has a concrete pad with a haul road. It's got a double fence line. I don't know if you can barely see it. There are two uh, eight foot chain link fences around the perimeter and there's one on the interior, one on the exterior. The, the in between the two fences is what's called a clear zone. And that's typically where you put your, your strongest electronic security. There are two Rocky Hill Road entrances. I'm not quite sure which entrance is going to be primary. I'm sure the one that, that is closest to the admin building is going to be used for sure. And then the one that goes into the Hall Road on the northern end of this uh, Rocky Hill Road, I'm not sure what's going to happen to that entrance. I would assume that will stay in place as well. The casts are as a protective base for the spent fuel on the pad. Control gates are for both personnel and vehicles. You can see them on the upper part of the IFSI is fizzy. And the personnel will come from the admin building. They'll go around the uh, site and enter the site in the personnel gate at the northern end. There's a vehicle barrier, a significant vehicle barrier surrounding the SFISI, as you can see with the white lines that are connecting on the outside. And then there's, as I mentioned, landscape uh, adjacent to Rocky Hill Road. Now, the next slide shows essentially a risk-based, uh, next slide, thank you, a risk-based approach. And it's the principal sequence in any integrated security design for any other for any other site, this site, any site, and even a jewelry shop, we would use the same approach. And it starts on the right with the identification of threats and risks. And then in order to build a security pro integrated security program where, where you have multiple elements that are integrated together, both physically and electronically. You focus on prevention, control, detection, and mitigation of the threat, which in this case, is the threat is radiological sabotage. Now, I'm not sure if I, I don't want to read this in its entirety, but radiological sabotage is a design basis threat for this ISFSI is fairly substantial. It is a determined violent external assault an attack by stealth or deceptive actions, including diversionary actions by an adversary force capable of operating in each of the following modes, a single group, a multiple group, a combination of one or more groups, one or more individuals, or individuals attacking through separate entry points of the ASFISI. They're well-trained including military training and skills. They're dedicated, they're willing to die just like a terrorist. So it's not the differentiation in radiological sabotage of, oh, well, in one side we have terrorists and the other side we have aggressive forces that are trying to destroy or get access to the radiological aspects of the site. They're not, our approach is the same for both. They are, they have suitable weapons, including handguns or handheld automatic weapons equipped with silencers and effective long range accuracy and uh, bullets. They can use land and water vehicles, which could be used for transporting their personnel and their 
hand carried equipment to the proximity of, of the vital areas. So that it's a very extensive design basis sorry, what, that we're talking about here. And the elements that you see in the blue are the individual elements that form an integrated security system and program. And those elements like personnel, barriers, communications, monitoring and display, things like that are all part of the ISFISI, all. So the ISFISI contains an integrated security program. Other ISFSIs, depending upon where they're located and, and when they were built, don't necessarily have this. And I can't tell you exactly which of the ISFSIs in the 34 states have this, but I can tell you that certainly this site is going to be a top-notch program. Next slide. Can I go back to that slide again? Nope, go ahead. Next slide. So I just wanted to show you in terms of risk, um, you may have your own risk matrix that you use, but essentially when we identify the threats and we determine the likelihood and the impact of those threats attacking a specific asset like the ASFISI, we identify it in terms of risk, risk probability, and it's expressed in quantitative or qualitative terms. The bottom left quadrant is your low impact, low likelihood attackers or events, working up to the high impact, high likelihood event in, in quadrant A on the upper right, to the high impact, low likelihood, and then the low impact, high likelihood. The ASPCI clearly falls in B quadrant. It's a high impact, but it's a low likelihood that somebody's going to, nobody's ever attacked an ASPCI in the United States. So the probability or the likelihood of the frequencies of previous events would indicate that it's low likelihood, but clearly the impact is significant. Next slide. So this is essentially going through the integrated approach, risk-based approach. You come up with a Pilgrim IS ISFISI that has the integrated countermeasure options listed on the far right. <coughs> Those are in place at Pilgrim. The bottom left of the slide that you see is a, is a uh, security control center that I designed for Genzyme Corporation in Cambridge. And that's typical of the interior of the security building that you'll see at the ISFISI that's in green on the upper left. Now I wanna mention for sure that the security personnel that I met and the security personnel that I know are assigned to the ISFISI are all gonna be taken from the current site. So they're all trained, they're all ready, they're all motivated. And I've got to tell you that I was very impressed with the security manager and the security supervisor that I met with. Having done virtually hundreds of sites all over the world, these people were pretty good. I can give you an example. I did a site in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, when the United States was selling AWACS planes to Saudi Arabia. And because it came from the United States, we had, they sent a team of us over to check on security. And it was a totally, I mean, a double fence, just like this is fizzy. We got there, got to the front gate, and guess what? It was time for prayer. So they opened the gate, let us in, and they took their rugs out and started praying to Mecca. And it was like, wait a minute, this is a security site. You can't do this. Anyway, anything can happen, but it's not going to happen in, in my estimation at Pilgrim is fizzy. I was very impressed with the personnel that I met. Next slide, slide. Now to Plymouth, the town of Plymouth and its responsibilities. Plymouth has a comprehensive emergency operations plan for mitigation, preparedness, response, and recovery um, from all types of hazards, both from a safety standpoint, and safety is our hazards that 
originate from accidental sources or natural sources. And the other one, security, is where hazards that originate from intentional sources, like we're talking about for the asphyxi. Now, the only thing I want to mention about the Plymouth uh, planning is that the Plymouth Emergency Operations Manager works for the fire department. When I asked the Plymouth security in terms of how many people from Plymouth Police Department are going to be your first responders, if anything happens at the Asphyxi, I was told that I can't tell you how many. I can tell you that they'll be armed, but I, we had coordinated directly with Captain Flynn at the Plymouth Police Department. There is information in the CEOP and there are other plans, but it's not up to date on the Asphyxi and today, and they need to look at that. Next slide, please. So my security observations are only two slides. I'm not gonna read the bullets for you. Um, the security is applicable whether you're located inside a protected area or outside in a separate ISFISI. The requirements that you see that I've listed there, I obtained from the security department at Pilgrim. I read every single one of them and I perform my tabletop, if you will, risk approach, design approach using those uh, sources. And of course the design basis threat is radi radiological sabotage. And there are just some exceptions like for an asphyxia, they don't have, uh, they use physical pat down searches of persons in lieu, in lieu of firearms and explosive detection equipment. And they also say, that a guard can observe an event or do surveillance and assessment on the uh, ISPISI, but they don't have to do it through video surveillance, but they do have video surveillance at this ISPISI. So that's above and beyond the requirements. Next slide. The item in red is my final observation. The ISFISI is consistent, security is consistent with requirements and considered adequate strong based upon a risk-informed and performance-based approach contained in the ISFISI security rulemaking. That's my conclusion. I think other people have different approaches and opinions, but I would suggest that those are opinions, whereas Mine is kind of a risk-informed and a professional approach to this. And so I don't think, I'll be perfectly honest with you. There seems to be some misinformation that the ISFISI is not secured. And I was approached by some people in uh, Manomet who said, I don't think the place is secure. And I said, I'll go check for you. My observation is it's secure. The key to the Pilgrim is FISI security is not just the, uh, what I consider to be excellent, physical, personnel, monitoring, all the different elements of the integrated program that they have right now, but they have to have a, a secure site, sound plans, trained and motivated personnel, monitoring, and then they have to have, I think, available current and actionable intelligence from the FBI, Plymouth Police, State Police. And by the way, the Plymouth, uh, Pilgrim I is 50 security people are totally tied into the uh, FBI intelligence network. So however it comes from Plymouth Police, State Police, or the FBI, these people are getting current information. The other thing I think we ought to do is we ought to establish a community neighborhood watch program between Holtec, Plymouth Police, and the uh, citizens surrounding Rocky Hill Road in the Rocky Hill Road area. When you cre it's created mainly around the concept of getting to know one's neighbors <coughs> and reporting suspicious or unusual behavior. There's sort of additional eyes and ears for the ISFISI since after decommissioning, that'll be the only location left of the power plant. 
So those are my observations, very simple. Um, I forget what your question was, Mary, but I'm gonna open it up to questions right now, if the chat's okay with the chair or the vice chair. We unmuted. Yeah, if you, you wanna take some questions, Rich, if there are any? Yeah, we got a few minutes. How's that? I don't wanna take a long time for questions. I, I got completely open agree. Mary, go ahead. We gotta open it up to the public. Mary's muted. I muted her. I, I have to go back. I have to go back. Meet Mary. Hang on, Mary. Hang on. It's on my end. Try now. Oh, go to somebody else. No. Is that okay? Yeah. There you go. Okay. Uh, the NRC, I understand, does not require force on force annual tests on the ISFSI. However, Rich, do you see that they would be valuable? And is there anything the Commonwealth could do to get them? I understand since 2008, there have been 4% of the times during these tests that the bad guys won, which is really a good thing because it provided, uh, you know, clues where a little fix here and there should be done. So the question is, are you in favor of that? And more significantly, is there any way these force on force tests could happen? I had a number of friends from the Army who were principal commanders of these force on force exercises for the NRC. I am strongly in favor of them. I'm more strongly in favor of them in terms of the ASFISI because it's the only site that's available. Um, it, it's a, I, I haven't looked into the mechanics of how that force on force exercise would work and what the, you know, the preconditions would be, Mary, but I wholeheartedly support it. I would think though that the NRC might, even though the ASFISI is gonna transfer to my knowledge, to the DOE and the uh, Holtec CDI, no, no, Patrick. Okay. No, no we're the li we're the licensee through Asfisi, so we, we we control that. So basically, if you control that and you report to the NRC, then maybe you can be an influence on getting some force on force exercises that are meaningful to the Asfisi. Oh, by the way, if, if, in case there's another question. There's an air gap on this ISFISI so that there's no cybersecurity problems going in or coming out of the site. The, the site uses a very sophisticated command control and display system called Linnell. It's one of the top systems in the world along with Software House and it's, it's excellent. So anyway, I hope I answered your question, Mary. Hey, you did, thank you. Okay, we're, um, we're fastly approaching uh, nine o'clock. We've got approximately 12 minutes to go. So let's uh, turn this over to the public line. Yeah, and, I've, got uh, one, I've got Diane Turco. Anyone? You could brief, hopefully on topic uh, with respect to anything that we discussed tonight. Go ahead, Diane. Oh, hi, hi, thank you. And good luck, Dave, on your retirement. Um, thank you, Rich, for that, that um, report. That was really interesting. I have a question. You mentioned that you know, you're looking at the consequences of a radiological sabotage and that there would be a significant impact. Could you please explain what that impact could be? I can't hear you. Rich, you're muted. Okay. <laughs> Probably a better answer when it's muted. Um, <laughs> uh, if, if you use, I'm not com completely sure of what that impact would be. I'm not uh, a, uh, you know, a, a nuclear engineer. Um, I do know that uh, uh, David Lockbaum ha has done a significant amount of research on the types of weapons and explosives that could potentially impact the Holtec CDI cask, <clears throat> but I, I didn't reference that for my uh, talk tonight because I didn't think it was relevant and I would
pass your question on to somebody else, depending upon how, what they use to gain, like for example, Holtec says that if you fly an F, it was an F-15 or an F-16 into a cask, it's not going to hurt it. I got to take the word for it because nobody's ever flown one in, into there, you know? So, um, Henrietta, can you go? Yes. Yes. Thank you. That it was really very helpful and very interesting, all of the reports tonight, and I appreciate that. Um, I did make quite a few comments in, in the chat in the in the chat that I think is seen only by the panelists, not by the other members of the public. I, I just I felt a little uncomfortable with your with your stating, Rich, that the ISFSIs are that nobody has ever attacked them. But they've been around for not that long. Um, so I don't think you can I don't think you can conclude that because they've never been attacked. They might not, they won't be attacked. I don't think that's really I a fair assumption. I where you're coming from, but as a security designer, using a risk-based approach, we look at frequency and likelihood and all the yeah. elements that would fit in. So if, this, if you're, the ISFSIs have been around for 20 years and need, none of them have been attacked, then- But the, 20 years is nothing. It's right, a very man, short time. I say 20 years is really nothing. I mean, the capital has been around for 250 years and yet, and nobody ever attacked it until January 6th. So I know it's not a nuclear installation, but it did have quite a bit of security for what it is. And nevertheless, it was attacked. I, I'm just pointing out that 20 years isn't a very long time to, to test that thesis. And I, and I wondered if you had considered um, attacks by air, but I think you did address that. Yes, you did, address, did address that. Yeah. Um, and cy cybersecurity, we, it does sound like an excellent system, but we do know that there have been several breaches and attempted breaches of cybersecurity by foreign national entities, probably Russian and Chinese, um, uh, on energy plants starting in maybe 2015. So I, I'm just, that, that may be why the public cannot, it doesn't, it's not self-evident that this is a secure uh, site. I, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just trying to express what members of the public might see when they're looking at this and might think. Um, and I don't feel personally completely reassured. And a lot of it, a lot of the need for assurance also goes back to the state of the casks and the possibility that they might degrade because they are not, because they're thin walled and are warranted for not very long, 25 years, I believe, if we can get a straight answer from Holtec. Um, and so I would sometime soon like to hear answers to the questions that Mary laid out in late February regarding the casks. And there were quite a few of them, so I won't rehearse them. That's, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you very much, Henrietta. Mm -hmm. Okay, Jim, you're up next. Thank you, Henrietta. Mm -hmm. Thanks. I'm not hearing you. Jim Lampert? No. Are you going to ask me a question, Mary? No. I think Jim Lampert. Jim, you're muted on your side. I'm going to send Mary over to your house. And there you go. That's it. Can you hear me now? Yep. Yes. No. Okay. I guess I want to start off with DJ. Just a couple of quick questions. I'm a little confused. In some of your previous, the minutes from previous meetings, you referred to a some type of report that was going to be filed in March and another one in May. Was anything filed in March? No, I don't think I ever, um, I may have, if I'm 
if I did, I was mistaken. So no, there was no report filed in March relative to the environmental site assessment. What I've been trying to do, hopefully consistently over the months is uh, speak to the requirements of the settlement agreement. And, you know, so Holtec had a goal of having this report delivered to us. You know, they may have said March at one point, but I think they've always more or less said in the May time window. No, there were, there were, there were, there were, there were it was clearly they were supposed to have what had been referred to, I think Matt referred to as sort of a final updated report to you in May, at the end of May, but there were references to some type of preliminary documentation you were going to be given in March. And I guess it was confused as to whether there was any such thing and did it ever happen? Yeah, uh, no, we didn't receive any preliminary report or anything like that in March. You know, we do meet every couple of weeks. So we talk about um, progress and we talk about what they're doing. And then recall back in the March, December time window, they did provide to us, which we acknowledge on a SharePoint drive, some of their plans for doing the sampling. So we've talked about that. But, um, you know, what I've tried to do is just be clear that, uh, you know, the May deadline is a, is a whole tech deadline. I think it's good that they set deadlines, things get done, uh, but it's not a settlement agreement deadline. Uh, those, those deadlines are the 30 days once we provide our comments to this report. And uh, I think timing wise, this is the right time for us to go on record through the Attorney General, consistent with the settlement agreement and get those comments uh, out there officially. And, uh, you know, as we talked about earlier, get this report out, out there in a way that people can see it uh, so that we can, uh, everybody can see uh, you know, where, where folks have looked and what they found and, um, and see what we think about that and what needs to happen going on in the future. Then if I get a, a follow-up to Matt, you said you hope to get this in within a week? Yeah, so May 31st is Memorial Day. Uh, I don't think any of us are excited about working over a holiday right. weekend. Right. I guess so. my question is, is it fair to say that it's basically written? Uh, it's probably, you know, 90% is going through comments, revisions with the, with the so I guess my basic like. question is, in the draft as it now exists, is there any information that Holtec is designated as confidential or trade secret? I think Holtec's going through that process as we speak. Are you prepared to submit a redacted copy on the same day if they do identify anything? I think the goal is to submit one report versus two versions. I think their settlement agreement says if they says anything is confidential, you, they are required to submit a redacted. You can read it. Okay. Then I just have a comment beyond that. My wife has sent over the both in May and in February a significant number of specific questions to Holtec and ask that they be answered. They range most recently from, okay, where are the TLDs as opposed to quote in the vicinity? And how do you explain the difference between what your attorneys say, oh, we'll only inspect Holtex casks and the fact that your presentation to the NRC says we can take credit for casks anywhere else. I am continuously struck by how many questions are asked of Holtec and how few answers going back years are ever provided. I don't blame Patrick for this. He works for other people and other people provide cover and what they don't provide is information. And I think this entire panel is seriously disadvantaged by the fact first that Holtec does not provide information and second, I didn't hear anybody on the panel raise any of the questions that were specifically asked of Patrick and he didn't answer. John, John, you're muted. I can't, we can't hear you, Mahoney. What was that last sentence? <laughs> he, he said nobody on the panel is being answered. I mean, I, I'll just speak to a little bit of it, Jim. I think I've been very, very forthcoming with a number of the answers, a number of them in writing. 
uh, to Mary specifics. The one she sent a couple weeks ago, I did let her know I've been in New York working on the IPEC transaction and I'm working to get answers. Uh, I'll be in New York next week. We're transacting that site this week. Uh, you know, I, I only have so much bandwidth. I have been, I, I feel like very forthcoming uh, with most of those answers. I looked at some of the stuff that Mary had referenced today um, that was supposedly hanging out there since February. And I've verbally answered a lot of those in these panels. Um, you know, and, and that's just some confirmation of other members on this panel that I've asked. I thought I answered those questions and they, they would agree. So really what I struggle with, and, and this is maybe a larger point to the entire panel, um, and, and it's, I think, to Jack's point, if we're going to have actions taken down, I think we need a register because um, not all the questions are for me. Even on those questions that were sent today, they're not all for me. Um, but if there's something to track that type of stuff that we can go through and check these off as done, uh, like I said, a number of the things that were supposedly still hanging out there from February, I know for a fact I've answered. So that's the frustrating part on my end. It's a lot of bandwidth. It's a lot of time. I'm more than happy to help and uh, try to get as much information out to the public as possible. Uh, and I feel like I've done a, a decent job of that. I understand, um, you know, there's some frustration, but, you know, just because some of the answers that I provide aren't liked by some people doesn't mean I didn't answer the question. Um, and, you know, and the frustration I have in some ways is the, the constant return to the casks. They're a licensed NRC system. If we want to go, if you have issues with the casks, you need to go to the NRC because they are a licensed system from the NRC. This panel is not going to solve that problem, but if you feel there's real concerns, please direct it there. I can only answer what I can. I've provided as much specs as I can. To Henrietta, what she said before, I've answered it repeatedly. The warranty is 25 years. I've said that multiple meetings and put it in writing on some of my slides. So there's the frustration I have in trying to help answer a lot of the questions this panel has. So if we can do something formal, Pine, where we have questions that are tracked and answered, I'm fine with that. Or I can continue to try to do these one-off when I get a list of 15 or 20 questions uh, and I have the bandwidth to respond. I, you know, I think, I think uh, Pat, that it might be a, a good idea. Although I will say that I think that limiting each panel member to three questions per uh, round would enable more questions to be answered rather than a dozen or three dozen. And, and that way you, get, you answer them, you answer them directly, you answer them right. What I have heard you say, Patrick, in terms of the cast is the warranty is for 25 years. We own the site, we own the shit, and therefore we own the responsibility for making sure everything's intact for as long as we're there. That's what I have heard you say. That is correct. Yeah, it's our responsibility as the licensee okay. to ensure that it's in um, compliance. Uh, may, may I suggest uh, that Patrick's comment that they just be checked off? You know, you have a list of questions, just is this been, been answered, that's been answered, that's been answered, and date. That just makes it simple. Can I? Yeah, but, but I think limiting to each person to three questions, there are people on this panel who haven't really asked more than one question in a couple of years. So that, that's senseless, as far as I can see. I can understand the point. Uh, hey, how are you, Jack? I, uh, I've got to get this hand up. I have one more question from the public. Um, maybe Jack wants to go first, and then we can allow um, Becky. Uh, I'll, I'll be quick. So I know internally, sometimes Pine, um, you struggle trying to put that agenda together. Sometimes, so, yeah. <laughs> So I'll volunteer to assist you with uh, adding to that agenda as we talked about at the last meeting, trying to organize these questions. You know, I can put them into a, I can put them in a table format. Here's the question, here's who it's assigned to, and here's the date we expect a response. And as that response comes in, we can add that as an agenda item and then close that question out. And then we've got a record that might address some of Pat's frustration with, I've already answered that question. We can refer the people back to that table. And yeah, that was question number 47, which we, which we answered on July 1st, 2021, if that would help. I, I, think, that, I think that will help because I went through the, the list of questions I sent them to John tonight, but uh, the meeting is such that we, we didn't quite get there. But you know, I think that would, that would help a lot because I have 
certainly heard answers to, to some of those questions. I'm gonna allow Becky to talk right now um, and then she'll be the last from the public to, uh, if that's okay with everybody, I hope. Go ahead, Becky. Thank you. Um, my question actually is for the ERM and you mentioned the high yield, high quality aquifer. And I wanted to know if you know the extent of that aquifer, does, how far off site does it go? Do you have any idea? Uh, it does go off site. It's mapped by, I believe, the US Geological Survey. Um, off the top of my head, I don't know how many square miles it is, but it is um, it is a mapped resource through USGS and I believe EPA. John, do you have any other comments to add on that? Uh, no, not really, Matt, Matt. That's exactly right. And as Gerard said, it's a, uh, an aquifer map by, map by USGS, so it's quite extensive. Yeah. Well, you know so I, yeah, that's, I think, the question, really. So, so Gerard can um, speak to this probably better than I can, but I think what we're talking about is this is in the Plymouth Cava Aquifer, which is a, a very large, uh, you know, largely sand and gravel aquifer with uh, pretty quick movement of groundwater, so very low hydraulic conductivity. And, um, but the real point here is that, as we've talked about in the past, in this location, it moves generally to the ocean, which is not surprising given, you know, where Pilgrim is relative to the ocean. This whole aquifer, you know, other than, uh, you know, the locations that we have uh, a river where it, you know, you know, sort of upwells into the river and goes to the ocean. But if you're plunk on the ocean, you're not near some kind of divide that would move it to some place where it would uh, gather in a river or a wetland. It's going to go to the ocean and it does go to the ocean in this location. What we talked about earlier is uh, enhancing the groundwater network so that uh, we can fine tune, uh, you know, exactly what, or, you know, as close to exact as you can, what it's doing uh, on that property as it heads to the ocean. It may have, uh, you know, some areas where it moves, you know, more southerly before moving ultimately east or more northerly before moving ultimately east. Um, the different features on that property might um, you know, um, sort of impact some areas of that general eastward flow. But in this location, it flows to the ocean, which is why when we talked about the PFAS contamination, we talked about it not being a drinking water concern because there's no drinking water supplies that's going to pull that general easterly flow uh, back against that, uh, that gradient through this rapidly moving aquifer. Right, but PFAS doesn't go away and all those fish that we love to eat are in the ocean. So they accumulate it to unfortunately the, the reality of the situation. So John, to you. Okay, I just want to thank everybody for participating tonight. How and do you want to, can, you t can you tell Jack how to proceed with that offer that he made and- Tell him how to proceed with it? Well, you know, how can you do that? Pine, I, Pine I'll call you off. Well, I'll talk to you offline. I, I've got a couple of ideas and I think it can be uh, addressed in short order. Okay. Okay. So the uh, the date of the next meeting is uh, right now scheduled for Monday night, July 26th. Uh, Ms. Dubois and myself have been in contact with Hack Television and the powers that be at Plymouth Town Hall. So in a perfect world, uh, for those of us who are comfortable going back to brick and mortar, it looks like that will be available. Some sort of a hybrid meeting. If you're not comfortable or if you just don't want to travel down to the brick and mortar site, <laughs> looks like the technology will be up and running by then to facilitate those who want to zoom in, but those who want to go back to pre-pandemic life, I think that opportunity will be before us. So I look forward to seeing you, some, some of you in the Great Hall at Plymouth Town Hall, you know, uh, two months from roughly today. So uh, if there's not anything else, does anybody have any motion to uh, a motion to adjourn? I'll add? make my last motion, the motion to adjourn. <laughs> Bye, Dave. Thank Second. you. Second? Second. All right, discussion? Uh, All right, thanks. all in favor? Uh, all right, thanks, here? everyone. Thanks. Enjoy your retirement. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thanks for everything. Thanks.